careful, warned Ryan. The glass sphere was loose where it attached to the wall plate. You have to make sure the retaining ring is in place before you open the interior partition. If one of these things gets jarred loose, we're all dead. Oh, sorry, said Anthony sheepishly. I thought that part was just used when you were done with it. Ryan didn't reply, other than to give his half-brother a hard stare. Anthony was good-natured, but he was also entirely too easy-going for the work they were doing. One accident would be too many while they were extracting and sealing the weaponized Crytek. If these things are that dangerous, wouldn't it be good to put a blanket down on the floor? asked Anthony, partly out of curiosity and partly because he couldn't stand long, awkward silences. Why? What if you drop one? They look really fragile. The glass spheres appear quite delicate. They were less than an inch in diameter, barely bigger than the end of a man's thumb, and the glass itself wasn't very thick. What Antony was failing to appreciate were the intricate runes engraved on its surface. To answer his question, Ryan picked up one of the unused glass containers and threw it at the hard stone beneath their feet. It struck with a dull clink, bounced twice, and rolled away. The enchantment makes them more resilient than steel, he added. The big danger is the transfer. Pay attention while I show you again, unless you want to wind up like poor Blake. Anthony watched while Ryan secured the retaining ring, and then, once the glass was firmly attached, he pulled the small lever that raised the small inner door, allowing the creatures in the other room a way to reach the container. Within seconds, one of the small wasp-like Crytek crawled in. Ryan reversed the lever, closing the door. And then, using a small metal stylus, he inscribed the final rune on the glass, activating the stasis enchantment before he removed it and sealed the top. We didn't have to wait long, noted Anthony. What makes them want to get in here so badly? Us, said Ryan blandly. They are attracted to any sort of aether, like a moth to a flame. Does that include animals or other things? I believe so, but they can survive and reproduce using only two food sources. Humans and the Shi'ar elders, explained Ryan. I tested one earlier on a rabbit to be certain. They went to it, but lost interest as soon as they were close. So, if one of those things escaped, it would find the first available host and burrow in to lay its eggs. The life cycle is very rapid. Within a span of less than a quarter of an hour, there would be hundreds, if not thousands. The cycle appears to run faster if the host has a large amount of aether. And then? They would spread. What remains of humankind would almost certainly be eliminated, along with most of the Shi'ha. Only most? I do not think they could cross the oceans. Unlike most Crytek, they can multiply and reproduce, but once they run out of food, they will stop. Three months after that, they will die, and the cycle will end. Anthony frowned. That's what you think, anyway. How do we know for sure? Ryan pointed at the sealed chamber with a metal finger. Even after we finish preparing the spheres, there will be some left in there. Without the benefit of the stasis enchantment, they should die. Emma doesn't intend to release them any sooner than that. We will have a firm answer by then. You put a lot of thought into this. Ryan shook his head, once again glad that someone like his brother wasn't in charge of the project. Wouldn't you, if the fate of the world rested on your decisions? Anthony chuckled. If my life were left up to me, I'd probably find a plump wife in Colne or maybe Lincoln and settle down. I might even get two or three wives. Then I'd spend my days making babies by the dozen. Two or three? Antony never ceased to amaze him with his ridiculous ideas. And then again, the world would probably be a quieter place if everyone was like him. No one would let him marry more than one woman, though, thought Ryan. Then again, that obviously didn't stop father. Directing his mental voice outward, he teased him. Perhaps you and Ian have more in common than I realized. Anthony made a sour face. Don't even joke about that. He's only interested in girls that say no. I'm the exact opposite. Ryan found himself remembering the test subjects, all carrying Ian's children now, and shuddered as a feeling of shame swept over him. He felt a lot of guilt about their situation. Guilt for capturing them and guilt for allowing Ian to play his part. It would have been better if someone, anyone else, had handled that part of things. But I wasn't able. Was he any better for not being able to commit the final sin, or worse, for allowing a sadistic bastard like Ian to do it instead? As he always did when confronted with uncomfortable thoughts or feelings, Ryan dragged his mind back into focus, putting it firmly on the task in front of him. 
It was something he had to do almost constantly these days. There was very little about his current life that didn't make him queasy. Back to the spheres, he told Anthony. There's one thing I'm surprised you haven't asked me. We can't all be geniuses, Ryan, said Anthony dryly. What did I miss? You haven't asked me how the Crytek will be released when required. Anthony decided to humour him. Very well, O oh Sage. How will they be released when the time of the apocalypse has come? Look at the runes here, Ryan said, pointing to one portion of the enchantment engraved on an as yet unfilled sphere. This links it to a master enchantment. Whoever has that can release them all at the same time with nothing more than a command word. They don't seem to make any sense, said Anthony, frowning. That's because they aren't a regular rune structure. They're an identifier, one that links that particular place in space with another. I don't really understand, admitted his brother, but it seems very clever. It was, cleverer than anything Ryan had seen before, except perhaps the stasis enchantment itself. Unlike most of the enchantments they used, which were derived from Shi'ar spellweaves that Tyrion had studied or otherwise learned about, this one was based on an idea that Ryan had come up with himself. I've tested it, and it works, Ryan told him, but the implications of what could be done with it make me wish I could spend all my time on it. Anthony sighed. I don't really care, but I know you're going to tell me anyway. Don't you see, said Ryan, warming to his subject. This is probably the sort of magic that underpins the way the Morden gift works. Teleportation? Exactly. They do it subconsciously, but that doesn't mean it can't be done deliberately, with careful planning and preparation. Using special identifiers like this, it might be possible to link two places that are separated by any amount of distance to create a portal that anyone could use to travel. If that were possible, why haven't the Shi'ar done it already? countered Antony. Perhaps they have, suggested Ryan. Or perhaps they haven't bothered. They have the Morden to rely on, after all. We know nothing about the extent of their experience and knowledge. Or it may never have even occurred to them. They aren't gods, after all. I don't think there's anything that they can do that we can't. They aren't any smarter than we are. Do you just sit around in your room at night thinking this shit up? Ryan shrugged. It beats thinking about what we're actually doing. Anthony smirked. I figured you had something more important to do with your evenings. His metal fist clenched reflexively, just as his original flesh and blood fist might have done. For a second, Ryan wanted nothing more than to use it to knock the knowing smile right off his brother's face. Instead, he took a deep breath controlling his anger. Mention that again, and things will get unpleasant, he warned. Antony had already realized his mistake. Glancing at his feet, he apologized. Sorry, Ryan, I didn't mean that. I mean, I understand, and it's none of my business. Let's get back to work. Yeah, replied Antony, and that's a good idea. How many of these do we have to do, anyway? A hundred? Ryan pointed at a large, straw-lined box in one corner. Thousands. Ugh. Chapter 33 And it had been little more than two months since Kate's emergency visit to the Prathian Grove. She and Lyra had stayed there for several weeks, until Lyra had had her own child, a boy. Shortly after that, though, they had relocated to Lyra's old home within the Elenial Grove. Kate couldn't complain about the accommodations, despite their strangeness. She still experienced a bit of vertigo whenever she looked down from the edge of the platform, but she solved that problem by not looking down. What she couldn't get over, however, was her constant fear that one day her baby might crawl over the edge. Little Layla was insatiably curious already, but she wasn't moving enough for that to be a problem yet. Lyra assured her that an invisible barrier would prevent such a thing, but it was hard for Kate to believe. Her brain might agree, but her heart was still worried. Lorelianthus' baby, Garlin, was named after Daniel's one-time friend among the Prathian Wardens. He had been born impossibly fat, but as his body began growing, he was soon merely chubby and cute beyond belief. While he was a month younger than Layla, he was already bigger, in part because he had been born with more weight, and possibly because Layla was still playing catch-up from her premature delivery. Kate glanced over at Lyra who was currently sitting down, nursing her young son, her long silver hair draped casually over one shoulder. She was the very picture of motherhood, beauty, grace, and love. She was everything that Kate was not, with her disheveled hair, worn face, and sagging skin. 
She had recovered much of her strength, but this pregnancy had left her with many more souvenirs of her experience than previous pregnancies. Her belly hung loosely in front of her, and she doubted it would ever return to its previous tone as it had after her first child. The marks on her skin made bright pink stripes around her middle. Perhaps it's better that he's gone. Daniel wouldn't recognize me now, she thought. Lyra looked up from her son, catching Kate's eye. Why she looked up, Kate couldn't be sure. Perhaps she felt her eyes on her, or maybe she was able to sense the dark turn of her thoughts. Whatever the reason was, Lyra smiled, and without any obvious purpose or cause, said, I love you, Kate. Kate had been struggling with dark moods, and that comment, immediately on the heels of her jealous thoughts, undid her. Tears began to slide down her cheeks. Lyra's expression turned to worry. I'm sorry, Kate. Did I do something wrong? No, said Kate, getting up and walking over to give the other woman an awkward hug. It's not you. It's me. Do you still miss him? Kate nodded. That was the simple answer, so she left it at that. She did miss Daniel, but she also mourned for their lost home and Layla. There were so many things to cry over, and yet crying had never been her way, at least not in the past. Since giving birth, she had found herself prone to long bouts of sadness, and she didn't know how to fix whatever was wrong. And in the midst of all that, I sit here being jealous of the one person who has been the kindest to me, she thought, chiding herself. Lyra was like the sister she had always wanted. But in the dream she had had as a girl, that sister hadn't been smarter, more beautiful, and eternally youthful. Don't worry, Kate, said Lyra calmly. We will go home soon. How? They will kill you if we go back. Lyra shook her head. We just have to get to Tyrion first. He can straighten things out. Kate looked at her without saying a word. The question in her eyes was plain enough. We will talk to him, convince him to return. You can do that, asked Kate. Bridget said he didn't respond to her. I have been talking to the elders my entire life said Lorelliantha. She probably did not wait long enough. Our words, our entire lives, are like flickers of light to them. To speak with them takes time and patience. I do not think Bridget is very good at that. The Elenial child has produced his offspring, said Salendor, as he made his report to the Sentir elders. Then it was not a ruse. The Elenials have truly betrayed us, responded one of the elders. They are giving their gifts to the humans said another. How well placed are your spies in the human encampment? Not very, admitted Salendor. Tyrion has kept them isolated, virtually imprisoned. How did you get this information, then? asked another elder. Someone had to feed them. His older children are well guarded, but some of their slaves were not as well protected, answered Salendor. Can one of them eliminate the problem? They might, responded the Shihar Law Warden, but they are clumsy and weak. It would be foolish to risk our plan on one of them. We need better information. Tyrion has vanished. It may be safe to try sending a reaver among them, suggested Salendor. Only to gather better information, ordered the most senior among the Sentier elders. The Elenial Grove will respond if we try to do more. Won't they know anyway? They only know what they will learn, responded the first elder. And what may happen. Until we make a decision, it will be too unclear for them. But they will respond then, commented the youngest elder. We will take that chance, said another. Isn't that their greatest strength, asked Salendor. Chance. Some types of chance, yes, responded the first. The chaotic doings of living beings follow patterns and make little difference usually. Conscious decisions about important matters become very obvious to them. Their weakness is when great choices depend upon entirely random processes. How can you make such a thing happen? asked the youngest elder. The humans have a saying that fits perfectly, explained the first. We roll the dice. I will send someone immediately then, said Salendor. Who will you choose? asked one of the elders who hadn't spoken before. Someone subtle. Sorelia, I think, answered the law warden. No, said Abby adamantly. Someone else can do it. Emma arched one brow. Why not you? I'm too busy. The kitchens have been a mess since Kate left, she responded. 
but the excuse sounded weak even in her own ears. You weren't too busy to deliver babies, observed Emma. In fact, you proved yourself to be a very capable healer. I'd rather have you do this. I want to avoid leaving obvious scars on them. It shouldn't matter, countered Abby. You're just planning to pop them in a box afterwards until they're needed, just like those poor women and their children. She had delivered dozens of newborns over the past month, with more still on the way. Tyrion's subjects were bearing fruit now, nearly a year after he had started his project. There were more still to come, but within a month or so they should be done. Our children, reminded Emma. Those poor women you mentioned were monsters, but father found a way to use them to our advantage. They should be grateful. Those children are our nieces and nephews, and the beginning of a new age. We should have put them in the boxes before they delivered, groused Abby. And if we should die, asked Emma, we don't know for certain who will be left when this is over. Childbirth is a risky thing, and the Sheha have no experience with it. Safer to deliver them now and store both. Do you hear yourself, Em? asked Abby. There's no feeling in your words. Store them. Does that sound like something we should be saying about human beings? The words don't matter one damn, said Emma, dismissing her remark. And I have no room for feelings in this. If I did... She stopped there, catching herself as her emotions began to rise. That's exactly why I won't do this, said Abby, coming full circle. I just can't thinking about what will happen to them. I saw what happened to Blake. It's horrible. You couldn't have seen that. You weren't there. Neither of us was. Violet showed me, mind to mind, said Abby. Emma frowned, tapping her chin with one finger. Why would she do that? Perhaps I should have a word with her. Because she's human, Em, said Abby in exasperation. Because she needed to talk to someone. What she saw nearly crippled her. How many people do you think see one of their own family members devoured from the inside out? I don't think she'll ever get over it. Emma's visage grew stern. If I can keep going, so can she, and so will you. You will do this, Abby. No. I'm not asking. You'll do it, or I'll apply pressure until you comply. Do you understand? threatened her sister. Abby straightened. No, I don't think I do. First, tell me exactly what you mean by that. If you're so worried about children and their welfare, you'll do as I command. There are an awful lot of them around here now. Abby was shocked. You wouldn't dare. Emma's lips formed a flat line. You need them for your precious plan. Not those children, Dullard, said Emma with an exaggerated sigh. The only other possibilities were Inara and Eldin. Abby's eyes grew round. Your own brother and sister. You couldn't possibly... Not in Nara, of course, said Emma coldly. But Eldin can't contribute to the future anyway. There's no need for him. He's a waste of food now that I think about it. Bridget would kill you. You're bluffing. The first raised one brow. Is it worth being stubborn, worth forcing someone else to do the job you would be best at to find out? Emma had once been her favourite sister, and despite all that had happened over the past year, she had continued to be empathetic to her situation and the pressures that it involved. But for the first time, she felt genuine hatred for her. Fine, you win, responded Abby angrily. You'll get exactly what you wanted. Emma smiled. You'll do it then. I will, but that's not what I was referring to, said Abby. You said before that you couldn't afford to have friends. I ignored you then, but you've made a believer of me. From this point on, you can count on it. You have no friends anymore, not one. The first remained still, though one eyelid twitched slightly. She gave no sign that Abby's words had affected her in any way. You'll start tomorrow morning, then. You may go. Abby left without a word, and in a move that was entirely uncharacteristic of her, she slammed the door as she left. Emma stared after her for several minutes, before lifting her hand to look at it, and was shaking like a leaf in a storm. With an effort of will, she re-engaged the privacy ward around the room. Only when that was done did she let go. Her shoulders began to shake, and her eyes filled with tears. When she opened her mouth finally, the only sound that emerged was a strangled shriek of despair. The pain in her chest was so great she almost wondered if she was having a heart attack. That was almost a welcome thought. Looking down at her enchanted blades, she wanted desperately to pick one up and thrust it into her own heart. She couldn't, so instead she wept. The storm of her emotions was worse than any she could remember experiencing before. It seemed as though it might never stop. It was only when she realized that the building itself had begun to shake that she reined herself in. Somehow her feelings had been transmitted to the earth, and the entire city had started trembling. Deep breaths, she told herself, 
working consciously to soothe the earth and make it be still once more. Chapter 34 You understand what is required? asked Sailandor. Sorelian nodded. Yes, and also that it is dangerous. Only if you mistrust yourself, said the Law Warden. That is why we so rarely allow this. Only a few have the necessary inner balance to survive the experience. You did, noted the Centaur woman. Shouldn't you do this? Your knowledge is far greater than mine. I am already well known among the Shiha, said Sailandor. Too many know me, and even the Crytek are often trained to recognize me. A new player is required. Your Aether will be much harder for them to identify. I am honored to be chosen, replied Sorelia. My only fear is disappointing the elders. Salendor smiled benignly. You will not disappoint them. Choose your target carefully. All we need for now is information. If more is required, you will be given new instructions. Remain vigilant. She dipped her head obediently and turned to go, but she paused before taking the first step. You have a question, he asked tolerantly. When it is over, when I rejoin myself, will it be easy? Do you have any advice? He wanted to laugh, but he cloaked the humor beneath a veil of patience. Nothing could be simpler. Trust yourself, and all will go well. And whichever of yourselves is stronger will return, he added mentally. No matter which it is, the centaur will be stronger. Salendor watched her leave. Within a matter of days she would pick her target, and a new reaver would be born. A noise alerted her to the arrival of a visitor. Looking up, Kate was surprised to see the black-skinned man standing at what passed for an entrance onto Lurilianthe's not-so-private platform. His name was a strange one, but she had heard Daniel say it many times in the past. Thilmarius. May I help you? she asked, trying to hide her nervousness. Her brief encounters with him had mostly been neutral, but she knew that Daniel hated him with a passion beyond any of his other hatreds. He gave her an unnatural smile. While he was somewhat better at it than many of the Shiha, Thalmanius hadn't completely mastered the skill. Actually, I thought I might bring you a gift. Kate wished Lorelianta was present, but she had left earlier, leaving Kate with both newborns to manage. She currently had one on either side of her nursing. She couldn't have felt more vulnerable. Lorelianta is out right now, she informed him. This isn't the best time. I'm sort of occupied. I promise I won't stay long, he assured her. Or if you wish, I can just leave it here, but I wouldn't want it to get cold before you taste it. Cold? I brought some fresh bread, and butter as well, explained the law warden. Gone was his artificial smile, replaced by an awkward and entirely genuine pride. For a moment he reminded her of a small boy, hoping to win his mother's praise with some accomplishment. She couldn't help but remember her son, Aaron, and the first time he had come home with a shiny rock in his pocket. The image was so at odds with the normal, distant nature of the Shiha Law Warden that she almost laughed. She was also starving, and the thought of bread after the bland diet afforded by the Illunials over the past month made her mouth water. Forgive my hesitation, she told him. Please come in. He did, and after assessing her state for a second, he asked, Since your hands are full, would you like me to cut a piece for you? Kate nodded. The law warden carved a delicate slice from the round loaf and then produced a small container and opened it. Using his athar, he drew a large dollop of butter from it and spread it evenly across the warm bread before bringing it over to her. She managed to lean back, balancing Garlin and Layla with her upper arms and using her now free right hand to accept the gift. Murmuring a quick word of thanks, she ate it in three large bites that were anything but ladylike. The bread was delicious possibly some of the best she had ever had. Daniel told me you had taken up baking as a hobby, but I had trouble believing it, she told him. Until now. Daniel, answered the Prathian, looking puzzled for a second, until he realized she was referring to Tyrion. Yes, he gave me some good advice on the matter. Did you know that my bread has become a sensation among the Shiha? I don't know how it compares to yours, but my people have never experienced such a thing before. Really? He nodded. In fact, some of them may well be angry with me for bringing you this. There's a waiting list to get a loaf. Kate hid a frown. 
Then why did you come? I had several motives, said Thilmerius honestly. I haven't been able to find Tyrion, and his children won't let me into Albemarle, but he had told me before that you were a good cook, so I wanted to see what your opinion was. I also wanted to repay some of my debt to him, but perhaps my biggest reason was curiosity. Her fear and concern came back to the fore, but there was little she could do. Thilmerius saw the change in her Aethar. Please don't be worried. I mean you no harm. The Prathians and the Elenials have been the closest of allies for many millennia. I simply wanted to see the truth of it. The truth? Lurilianthus' baby, he clarified. I knew you were having a child, but no Elenial female has ever given birth before. It has raised a storm of rumors among the Prathian law wardens. People are talking about it. Only our law wardens know, said Thilmerius. Keraltis was very circumspect, and we will not share the information with the other groves. Do not fear. But this is a very unusual event. His words made her even more apprehensive, but it also piqued her interest. Why is it so unusual? The Elenial gift is more closely guarded than that of the other groves, said Thilmerius. Speaking objectively, it's the main reason we still exist. Without it we wouldn't have survived in the past, or been able to traverse the dimensions to find this, our last sanctuary. And that is why the Prathians are so closely tied to the Elenials. But practically speaking, our gift, while useful, is the least powerful of any of the Shi'ar talents. Is that why you protect their secrets? Most assuredly, answered Thilmerius. Their assistance keeps us on a more even footing with the other groves. Outwardly the Shi'ar may appear monolithic to you despite the superficial differences in our skin colouring, but we operate purely according to our needs. The five groves would strive with one another for dominance if the Elenial gift did not hold sway. They are the keystone to the balance of power that maintains our society. Daniel once told me the Elenial grove is the smallest of the five, said Kate. If they are so important, why would that be? When you are powerful, you have little need for numbers or a show of strength, replied the Law Warden. She was shocked, not by what he had said directly, but more by the fact that the Shi'ar seemed to suffer from many of the same flaws that humans did. I thought your people were naturally harmonious. Harmony is born of necessity. Why are you telling me this? she asked. Thilmerius was silent for a moment, as though deep in thought. I think perhaps it is because I owe your mate a debt, and your people, but there are practical reasons as well. If humanity should gain the Elenial gift, then it may become an important power in the future. Obviously, the Elenials have some reason for what they're doing, and it involves your race. Helping you might induce your people to view mine in a more favorable light. It was a statement of fact that a human might have kept hidden, but Kate still appreciated his honesty. She felt compelled to return the favor. You know Tyrion distrusts you. She disliked calling Daniel by that name, but she decided that using it would simplify the conversation. Which is why I'm giving you this warning, said Thilmerius. Perhaps if we find ourselves in need of support some day, you can convince him to give it. Warning. While the conversation had been interesting, she hadn't thought it to be that ominous. The Law Warden nodded. Yes, if the other groves discover the fact of Lurilianthus's birth, they are unlikely to view it in the same light that my people do. They will see it as a betrayal. They will probably seek to undo it. Do you mean a war? she asked. You might call it that, he agreed. They would try to destroy the child. Wouldn't that start a war? He shook his head. Not in the sense you mean. There would be struggle to assassinate the boy. The Sentier and the Morden make highly efficient killers. The Galen would probably support them, while the Elenials and my people would try to protect him. That sounds an awful lot like a war. He shrugged. Only until the child was dead. Once the matter was decided, it would be pointless to continue fighting. All parties would cease fighting. Unlike your people, we do not hold crutches. And that is also why we must keep the child a secret. Despite their power, the Elenials couldn't win. Killing one person is an easy thing, and the Sentier and Morden are uniquely gifted for such a task. They could attack knowing their victory would end the hostilities almost immediately, whereas the Elenials would be forced to defend a weak point indefinitely. In fact, they might choose not to fight at all, unless they had a dire reason. Secrecy is your best, perhaps your only, defense. Kate was horrified.
I don't understand, said the young man. His name was Allred, but Abby would have rather not known. It only made her job harder. Like most of her subjects, he was a Morden mage, originally from Sabotrea. After taking a few of the slaves from the other camps, Tyrion had directed them to focus their efforts on bringing most of their laborers from there. Now that she understood most of his plan, Abby knew why, and the thought made her shudder. I'm going to put you to sleep, and make certain that you don't feel any pain. At least that part was true. But what is this thing for? he asked. She held up the small glass bauble. After I'm done, you'll be put in a stasis box, possibly even one of the ones you made. It will be taken to where you will be needed, and when it's open, this device will enable us to send and receive word letting you know what is to be done, she lied. The only word he would receive would be the signal that ended his life. But what do they want me to do? asked Allred anxiously. Tad was watching from one side of the room, and he leaned over. It will be easy. All you need to do is focus on the fact that once you finish, we'll remove those tattoos. You'll be free to do as you please then. Allred nodded and Abby put him to sleep, grateful to end the conversation. Once he was unconscious, she blocked the nerves around the entry point, his belly button, and began guiding the glass sphere to its destination, a place deep within his chest, near the heart and lungs. The placement was almost arbitrary, but it did have some practical benefits. The Aethar was stronger there, which would speed the Crytek up, and it would make the enchanted glass harder to spot should someone manage to observe one of their subjects before they were activated. Abby also consoled herself that being near the heart, it would probably kill the man faster and shorten his suffering. She closed the opening as soon as the sphere was within, and when she finished, the only sign that she had done anything was a small drop of blood. Wiping that away, she nodded at Tad, indicating he could take the man away. You all right, Abby? asked her brother. No, she admitted. Tad patted her on the back. That's the twentieth one you've done today. Anyone would be tired. Another week at this rate, though, and we'll be done. He was completely clueless, and the look she gave him should have conveyed that. He's the twentieth one I've killed today. If it was just being tired, I wouldn't be this upset. Tad's face changed. I know it's awful, but it isn't you killing them, Abby. Have you always been this stupid? She asked him bitterly. He started to reply, but she held up her hand. Never mind, just shut up. I don't want to talk about it. I'm done for the day. If it makes you feel better, tell the first that I'm tired. I'll be in my room. She left. Back in her room, she stared at the wall, too numb to even cry. This had been her life for the past two weeks. Every evening she dreamed of making a stand, refusing to continue. But she knew that in the morning she would get up and do what Emma required. Chapter 35 the field around Tyrion's tree was awash with the late summer sun. It was one of the few times of year that the high pasture was truly warm, but it wouldn't remain that way for long. Another month and the cold autumn wind would return, and only a couple of months after that the first snow might come. Winter always came early in the hills. But today was warm, and that was all that mattered to Kate and Lurilliantha as they walked toward the only large patch of shade, the area sheltered beneath his tree. By the standards of those who lived in Cole, it was a large tree, over sixty-five feet in height already, but to Kate's eyes now it looked small. In the deep forest, the god trees grew much larger. Even the normal trees, oaks and elms that bordered it, made this one look modest by comparison. Few trees grew this large in the hard soil of the hills. Where did this stream come from? she asked. The trickle hardly deserved the name. Rivulets would have been a better moniker. I haven't been here before, responded Lyra, but I would guess that Bridget diverted a spring or something to help him grow, since the rain is sparse up here. There had been a spring on the other side of the hill, one that trickled down to the river, but Kate couldn't imagine how one person could move such a thing. She had seen so many things that defied description, though. What was one more? I wish we could have bought the babies, she said at last, changing the subject. Garlin and Layla were with Helen, who had been delighted to see her newest grandchildren. Despite having so many, she had been denied the opportunity to see most of them until they were nearly grown, aside from Inara and Eldin, of course. Thinking of those two made Kate worry again. They were never far from her thoughts, and a large part of her hope today regarded them. 
If they could convince Daniel to return, if he could return, then they could go back to Albemarle. We will be here for quite some time, reminded Lyra, and we won't be able to care for them while we wait. How many hours will it take? asked Kate. Lorelianthe's lip curled into a half-smile. A better question would be, how many days? That's too long, protested Kate. Do you not trust Helen with them? She shook her head. No, it's not that, but someone has to feed them. Garlin and Layla were three months old now, nowhere near close to being ready to be weaned, and certainly not so suddenly. Lyra frowned. There was a lot she still didn't understand about raising children. The thought of food hadn't occurred to her. She had just assumed that their grandmother would have some solution. Perhaps you should do this then, she suggested. Once I help you reach the proper state, I can return to assist Helen. Can't we take turns? She glanced at Lyra's somewhat smaller chest. Her friend had never been overly endowed, and she doubted she could keep up with the demand of two infants. She also knew that if she didn't feed them regularly, her own supply would dry up. That will complicate things, said Lyra, but it is possible. In the end, they agreed to twelve-hour shifts, after Kate insisted that full days were too long. Lyra really had no understanding of how infants or her own body worked, but Kate convinced her it was necessary. Lorelianta produced a complex spell weave and constructed an odd shelter beside the tree. It looked something like an odd cocoon, open to the bark on one side and open to the weather on the other. But as soon as Kate stepped into it, she could tell that it somehow kept stray breezes from entering through the exterior opening. The interior was warm without being suffocating, and it held two seats that would allow them to recline against the bark while still keeping them comfortable. Did you just think this up? asked Kate. No, said Lyra. I have done this many times. She gestured at one of the seats. Sit. I will guide you into the proper state before I go. I'm supposed to just sit here for twelve hours. It's a little like going to sleep. Your sense of time will change. It will seem like only minutes before I rouse you again to take your place. Kate did as she was told, and then Lyra placed her hands on her temples before kissing her on the forehead. Do not worry. I love you said the Shihar woman. Kate started to reply, but the world faded, or perhaps it was just her eyes closing. She was enfolded in a warm darkness. And then she felt him. Daniel! It was Kate's voice. As always, it warmed his heart, though he knew she was just a dream. Yes, my love, he responded. You need to come back, she told him. Usually she was more relaxed in his dream, content to relive the past, or occasionally to engage in an extended game of what if. He had few regrets about his current condition, and generally his dream actors followed suit. That would be unpleasant, he told her. The world can get on without me. And then she vanished, replaced a moment later by Lorelianta. Please return, she said. I like it here, he answered, but she was gone. Kate was back. You have two new children, Layla and Garling. A good choice of names, he noted. Layla is dead, Lorelianta told him. This is just a dream. Now you're just making things up. Then Kate returned, looking sad. Emma is losing her mind. She's threatening Lyra. Lyra was there again before he could even reply. The constant shifting was beginning to irritate him. Stop it, he ordered. This is too chaotic. He attempted to focus on her, to make her image remain. This is no vision, Tyrion. I am here. Kate and I are taking turns. We have to feed... She was gone again. Our children need us, Daniel. They need you, added Kate. Kate woke with Lyra looking down at her. This isn't working, she said. He still thinks we're a dream. He is still young, said Lorelianta. Most elders spend several decades dreaming before they begin to think more actively. It takes even longer for them to learn to speed their thoughts. Speed their thoughts? Normally when we speak to them it takes a long time, said Lyra. But in times of crisis, the elders, the mature ones at least, can increase their subjective time to the point of being able to converse with us in our perceptual time frame. They dislike doing it, but it is possible. How old is mature? asked Kate. Several hundred years. Kate sighed. The children will be grown before we rouse him. 
We simply have to convince him, said Lyra. Once he understands our message, his response could be rapid. This is no dream, said Lyra. There is danger. He ignored her. Kate appeared. Emma plans to destroy everything. As I taught her, he murmured. Lyra returned, but before she spoke, he felt something new. Fire. One of his limbs was burning. The world shifted as the Shihar equivalent of a surge of adrenaline coursed through him. A bonfire had been built beside him, and its flames were tall enough to reach his lower branches. Sending forth his will, he quenched the blaze, and then he turned his attention to the tiny being that had been feeding the fire. A woman, her Aethar familiar, stood staring at the now defunct fire. He considered killing her to prevent any further attempts. He examined her more closely first. Bridget had once threatened to set fire to him if he didn't return, but this wasn't her. Is that Kate? Lyra spoke. Of course it is. She is desperate. We need your... She was gone, and Kate was back in his dream. Please wake up! Did you try to set fire to me? he asked. Yes, she did, replied Loreliantha, replacing her. I thought you were a memory. Help me, Daniel, Kate begged. She was really there. The knowledge produced a surge of feeling, and he wanted to hold her. But she faded as he tried to put his mental arms around her. Now she was Lyra again. I love you, he told her. It was true no matter which of them heard him. Wake up, said Loreliantha, kissing him. I love you, he repeated, and then Kate bit him. Wake up, she insisted. Tyrion moved. I felt similar to standing and shrugging your shoulders, flexing the muscles after a long night in bed. He gathered his will, and then he directed his thoughts outward. The sun wheeled across the sky above, and the earth embraced his roots below. He remembered his days as a man, and he let the vision fill him. Opening his eyes, he saw her, reclining in a strange spell-woven shelter of some sort, her red hair falling chaotically around her as she lifted her head to look back at him. Kate looked older, tired and worn. There were circles under her eyes, and her once cute freckles had become a riot on cheeks that were no longer quite as firm. As she stood, he could see that her chest was larger, and it hung lower beneath her dress. She looked like she had been through an ordeal, but she was still beautiful to him. Within her eyes he still saw the spark that had once made his heart jump, though it was almost hidden by her tired expression. Kate could see him appraising her, and she looked away. Daniel looked the same as ever, possibly younger. His once restored ear was gone again, replaced by the mangled remnant he had had in his twenties, but otherwise he looked fit and healthy, the very picture of vitality. Of course his naked skin was still covered by a multitude of garish tattoos. As she looked back, she saw that Lyra was approaching them, walking up the gentle incline. Say something, Kate challenged. He tilted his head, and finally, after a long pause, he replied. I've lost the habit. Why did you leave me? Leave us, she asked. Lorelyantha had stopped, standing some fifteen feet away, content to watch their reunion. I would not have survived, he responded. Afterward, after I had changed, it was peaceful. I thought the world would be better without me. Kate looked up at him, her eyes watering. Selfish ass! I love you, he told her. Watching them, Lyra felt a new emotion. She was overjoyed by his change, and she was happy, and yet beneath it all, she felt something dark. As Tyrion and Kate looked at one another, she felt something pass between them, something stronger than she had ever had, a bond that she would never fully be a part of. Is this jealousy? She pushed it aside. Stepping forward, Lyra spoke. Would you like to meet your children? Chapter 36 It was very late before most of them fell asleep. But Tyrion was wide awake. He sat in his mother's rocker in front of the modest hearth, holding Layla. 
Alan was the only other person still awake, sitting nearby in his own chair with Garlin in his arms. The two men sat quietly, rocking a little now and then, and enjoying the silence as they stared into the flames. His mother had been the first to bed, exhausted by the shock of his return. She had gone into a frenzy of cooking and talking, but her old body was no longer able to sustain such energies for very long. Kate had followed her not long after, and Lyra had been next. His return had been cause for excitement, and everyone had been determined to fill his attention and his ears with all the news, with everything he had missed, and should have worn him out, but he still wasn't tired. Perhaps his time as a tree had counted for sleep. Only his father had remained relatively subdued. Alan had given him a brief hug, and then had seemed content merely to listen to the women talk as they attempted to describe every detail of the past months. Tyrion and his father hadn't been close in many years, not since he had returned and taken his nearly grown children from Colm. Alan had been drinking at the time, and his last major confession had been to tell Tyrion that he wished he had never been born. The emptiness still hung between them, cold and dry. He didn't hate his father or resent him. If anything, he thought his father's words had been more than justified. In the grand scheme of things, he had been a colossal disappointment as a son, as a human being. I didn't mean it. The words fell into the silence. Strange and unexpected, they came from Alan. Yeah, you did, said Tyrion. And you were right. I still shouldn't have said it. You were drunk. Doesn't excuse it, said Alan. Sober or drunk, I meant it, then. I've had a lot of time to reflect since. And now? Alan didn't look at him. You're still the boy I raised and loved, whatever else you've become. You did some things I can't forgive, but everyone walks their own path. I can't judge you from the life I've lived. Tyrion swallowed, trying to clear the lump that had risen in his throat. Dad, you still scare the shit out of me, interrupted his father. That's probably wise said Tyrion, but I would never hurt you, or Mum. I'm not worried about that, son, said Alan, clarifying. I'm too old to worry about myself, but it's the young ones I fear for. He shifted his arms slightly, lifting Garland to emphasize his point. I wouldn't hurt them either. Alan glanced at him, his eyes catching the firelight. Don't make promises you can't keep. Tyrion looked down, letting his vision focus on Layla. His father was right. I couldn't even promise that. They sat in silence a while longer, though it was somehow more comfortable than before. Eventually, Alan spoke again. I ever gone to hold a little one like this before? Just in horror, said Tyrion, and only for a few months before I was forced to become a tree, finished his father. Yeah. You've given me more grandchildren than any old man has a right to expect, said Alan. It's good to finally be able to hold one. You got to raise one, thought Tyrion, thinking of Haley, but he held his tongue. Bringing up his dead daughter wouldn't improve the conversation. Bridget stayed with you for a while recently, he said instead. Alan chuffed. That girl's weirder than you, and scarier too, maybe. True. Another quarter of an hour passed before his father spoke again. What's it like, having two wives? The question caught him entirely off guard. They aren't really both my wives. Lyra calls me her... Don't talk around it. Just tell me, son. I'm genuinely curious, said Alan. I didn't set out to wind up in this situation, said Tyrion. But it isn't as strange as you might think. How do you decide who... Alan let the question trail away. Mostly they decide that, answered Tyrion. I suspect they think of me like a dog. They figure out between them who has to feed and water it from day to day. Alan gave out a small laugh. You are a chore, no question about it. Tyrion appreciated the remark. Then he stared down at Layla once more, fascinated anew as he watched her breathing. They change you, don't they? said Alan. One minute you're just you, the next you realize you have someone who depends on you for everything. Changes your priorities, as it should, I suppose. Tyrion didn't answer, merely nodded. 
He wondered what his father would think of his old plan. It wouldn't be positive, he was sure. What are you going to do when you go back? asked Alan. He had no real idea. I think I need to find a new path, he said at last. You know they want us to move, right? Was that part of your plan? Yes, he admitted. One of the good parts, maybe. I want to give people a chance to build a better future. I like where I live. But I have to make sure you survive, thought Tyrion. Unless... Does it make sense trying to get shepherds and farmers to live in a city, no matter how grand it is, opined his father. We need space, otherwise there'll be no wool and no crops either. It would only be temporary, said Tyrion. A new idea was rising in him. Maybe you won't have to move. Have to, said Alan with a frown. Nothing's been said about having to. A lot of us won't go at all. Bad choice of words, he lied. I do need to change things when I go back, though. It isn't going to be easy. That's life for you, said Alan. I don't know how to do it, he admitted. Everyone expects certain things, and there's a lot I can't control. His father stood, carrying the infant in his arms over to one of the two cradles on one side of the room. Settling the babe carefully into his place, Alan straightened and looked toward his son. The answer's right there, in your arms. I don't know what you're into or how any of that magic stuff works, but I've lived long enough to know how to make decisions. There's no secret to it. Apparently I failed to learn something obvious then. Alan put his hand on his shoulder, squeezing slightly before moving on toward his bedroom door. It's easy. Just think about that child you're holding. Whatever you're doing or going to do, think about how it will affect her. One way or another, they'll tell you what you should do. Night, son. And then Alan Tennant went to bed. Tyrion didn't sleep that night. He sat up through the dark hours, staring into the fire as it burned down to embers. The two men watching the gate at Albemarle didn't recognize him. It was an unusual sensation for him. Tyrion had risen to great heights of notoriety among the slaves of the Shi'ha, and eventually among everyone else as well, human and Shi'ha alike. But that had been years ago, and while most knew his name and reputation, many of the newer slave mages who had come to Albemarle did not know him on sight. These two stared at him nervously. Please wait, sir. We'll get someone to verify you are who you say you are first. He fought the urge to smirk as he watched one run off, looking for someone with more authority, presumably one of his children. Neither of these two were very bright. The intensity of his aura was enough to tell them that he was no ordinary person from the slave camps. That, combined with his tattoos, should have been enough to convince them. Once, he might have killed them to make a point, not simply as a blind response to being challenged, but also to maintain his reputation, to instill fear in those who served him. He was not that man anymore, however. He had changed, and today would be the day he began teaching a new way to those around him. My old way was just a reaction to what happened. I fought hard because I had been abused, but the fighting only made me more of a victim. Going forward, he would make his choices based on something greater than his pain. The cycle of pain wouldn't be resolved by hurting his enemies. It was just the opposite. Convincing the children who he had inflicted his madness on would not be easy, though. He knew that, but if there was anyone in the world who could do it, it had to be him. No, it could only be him. They wouldn't listen to anyone else. Antony appeared, and the look of surprise on his face was clearly evident. Father! Antony, he said, nodding his head slightly. He moved forward, passing through the arch and ignoring the two guards. I didn't believe them murmured his son. After Bridget came back alone, I never thought you would return. Nothing ever works out the way we think it will. I told the guard it couldn't possibly be you when he found me, said the younger man. Otherwise he'd be dead for trying to make you wait. I've gained some perspective since leaving. How are things here? Antony glanced at the two guards who still hung close, listening. Back to your posts, he ordered. Walking toward the main house with his father, he replied. Everything has gone according to your plan. The first sort of that. First. Emma. The sound in his son's voice as he named her told him much. 
Emma was no longer popular among her siblings. She killed Layla, added Antony in a more subdued voice. She might have killed Lyra too if it hadn't been for Layla's intervention. Kate and Lyra have fled to the Prathian Grove. So I heard, said Tyrion. He touched his son's arm, indicating he should stop. Before we go any farther, let me make this clear. I'm not here to punish anyone. The look in Antony's eyes was one of disappointment. Oh, we've all made mistakes. What is important is not what was done, but what we do from here forward. Where's Bridget? Behind the main house, said Antony. She's been taking care of Eldin and Inora. I saw her out there earlier, playing with them. Tyrion's brows went up. Bridget? She was put in charge of them after Kate left, and Layla. An odd choice, noted Tyrion. She's hardly the nurturing sort. Emma was angry with her for interfering. I think it was a punishment as much as anything else. Tyrion felt a vague sense of unease at the thought of Bridget being the primary caretaker for anyone, much less his younger children. I need to see this. His mage sight was already focusing on the area in question. As they approached, he could see she was throwing the children around the yard, tossing them like balls into the air. It looked dangerously violent, and his stomach tightened involuntarily. But as they drew closer, he could hear the two children giggling. She would launch them, spinning and tumbling away from her in random directions, and at a casual glance it appeared as though they landed hard, but she was actually interfering in subtle ways. Their falls would slow before they struck the ground, cushioning them just enough to make what might have been a bruising landing into a thrilling but harmless stop. As soon as they could get their feet under themselves, they would try to stand, frequently falling over, dizzy and uncoordinated, before charging toward her as quickly as their little legs would carry them. She would let them get almost close enough to grab her before tossing them up and away again. She was smiling. Tyrion saw all this before he turned the corner. There were many people in the area with strong auras, so Bridget hadn't taken much note of him yet. But once he rounded the corner, it was apparent that he was coming to see her. A smile vanished as her attention focused on him, and he saw the chain lift itself from the ground beside her, moving to float in the air between her and the newcomer. Her face remained still as she recognized him, concealing her shock. I'll be damned, said Tyrion. Enara and Eldin finished running back to her, this time unhindered, and they clasped her legs as she stood, laughing with joy at their catch. They still hadn't noticed him, but when they did, Eldin pointed. Who? Father, said Bridget softly, as much a greeting as an answer to Eldin's question. Father, repeated Enara. Nice dress, said Tyrion, noting the simple green shift that Bridget was wearing. His daughter's face flushed with embarrassment in much the same way a normal person's would if they had been caught naked. It keeps them from trying to latch on, she observed, pointing at her chest. Or it did. I got a little used to it. The plain dress was dirty and rumpled, a stark contrast to the children themselves who looked much cleaner than she did. Bridget had changed in unexpected ways. He wanted to ask her about everything, but a number of people were approaching from several directions. Word of his arrival had spread, and his children were coming to see the truth for themselves. In ones and twos they came. Antony and Violet were first, and then Piper appeared. They stared at him with something close to hope in their eyes, something he had never expected to see. Tad and Ashley were next, followed by David and Sarah, then Ian, each of them stopping some ten feet away, unconsciously arranging themselves around him in a semicircle. Abby looked the most relieved to see him as she strode up anxiously. A dozen questions rose from them, but before he could answer any of them, they fell silent. Emma and Ryan had arrived, the two he had been closest to, his most trusted, and now their leaders. The air was tense as his children waited to see the result of their reunion. Tyrion studied Emma with a stern gaze. She was gaunt, she had lost weight, and there were dark circles beneath her haunted eyes. Her former serenity was gone, replaced by a hardness that reminded him of himself. The past year had transformed her. The old Tyrion might have killed her for her action regarding Lyra, and especially for Layla's death. But he felt something different now. Seeing her was like gazing at his own soul, or at least at the version of himself that had existed a year ago. 
He had put her in charge knowing her heart had been poisoned by rage and hatred. He had given her the reins because she was the most like him. Some of her choices might be different than what his might have been, but they had been executed in the same relentless spirit and for the same reasons he had once believed in. Whatever she had done, he might as well have done himself. And those decisions had nearly destroyed her. She crossed the invisible line that the others had stopped at, some ten feet distant, and approached until she stood directly in front of him. Emma's back was straight and her neck unbowed. You actually came back? she said. He wanted to embrace her, to take away the pain, but he knew her, knew himself too well. That would never work. Instead, he told her what must be lurking on the surface of her mind. I heard about Layla. Kate and Lyra woke me, forced me to come back. Someone snickered faintly as he said it, Ian expectantly watching. Tyrion ignored it. Emma looked him straight in the eyes, seeing the judgment there and without warning, she knelt before him, turning her face to the ground. I did as I saw fit, but I will accept whatever resolution you seek. Her aura became brighter, and Tyrion could almost sense the burden lifting from her shoulders. She wanted to die, and his return had given her hope that he would end her suffering. They made him want to cry for her, but he kept his face expressionless. Did you do as I said? he asked firmly. Yes, father answered Emma. He looked at Ryan. Is the construction finished? The parts that are required were done months ago. All we do now is to add to the city that will never be used to maintain appearances, responded his son silently. The slaves, the Morden. They're ready, answered Ian. They need only be awakened. They had done it. Emma had done it driving them according to his wishes until they were ready to unleash a doom that would destroy the world. All that remained was to gather the people of Colne and Lincoln to put them in the places prepared to keep them safe. A word from him, and they would turn the world to dust and ashes. But he no longer wanted that. What a cruel irony, thought Tyrion. They did it, but I no longer want it. He turned his eyes to the rest of his children, searching their faces and then he spoke. Some of you are hoping I will punish her for what happened to Layla. You will be disappointed. Everything Emma has done has been in my name, and she has done well. If any of you have a grudge against her, you may bring it up with me. Otherwise, you may as well forget it. What is past is done. Kate and Lurilliantha will be returning tomorrow, and there will be no more dissension among us. Do you understand? Their voices answered firmly a smattering of yes-fathers ringing out. Bending down, he took Emma by the shoulders, lifting her to stand on her feet again. Do you understand, Emma? Yes, father. There was a mixture of relief and shame in her eyes. You did well, he told her. Rest for now, eat something. You've shouldered an unbearable burden for far too long. Let me carry the weight now. Emma kept her back straight, but her eyes were watering. "'Shh,' he whispered, giving her a wink. "'Don't let them see you cry. "'I'm proud of you, but you can't let them see your weakness, "'not after ruling them.'" Chapter 37 The next two weeks were largely uneventful. Autumn progressed into the first snow of an early winter, and the people in Albemarle slowed down. The frenetic pace was gone. Tyrion's return had left them all wondering what would be next, but when he didn't appear ready to do anything in particular, everyone gradually began to relax. The quality of the food certainly improved with Kate's return. Some things were awkward, of course. Kate made no attempt to speak to Emma, actively ignoring the woman who had killed her friend, and was the best she could do. Abby was much the same, refusing to speak to her sister unless absolutely necessary. Emma, for her part, actively avoided Kate whenever possible. Lorilliantha, true to form, acted as though nothing had happened. Bridget continued to play with Inara and Eldin whenever she got the chance, having discovered that she had more in common with children than any of the adults around her. Inara and Eldin had some difficulty adjusting to Kate's return, not being entirely sure who their mother was, but with time there was little doubt they would sort it out. In the main, they seemed delighted to have so many people interested in them. 
Kate and Lyra both spent time with them, and having Bridget for a devoted big sister meant they never lacked attention. They were a bit skeptical about the two infants that had replaced them as the absolute center of attention, but they would adapt to that as well, eventually. Tyrion did nothing. Nothing of note, anyway. He ate, slept, and enjoyed watching the others, but he made no attempt to change anything or further his old goals. He let his old plans sit dormant, and when he did consider them, it was to wonder how he would eventually dismantle them. He told no one of his change of heart, thinking that time would make it easier. So he decided he would merely stall things for a year, and then begin to make his new wishes known. Once his children got used to waking up each day without contemplating the end of the world, they might be more amenable to creating a more peaceful future. Let them grow fat and complacent with hope for tomorrow, he thought for himself. Eventually, they will want tomorrow more than vengeance. When midwinter drew close, he invited Thilmarius to join them for a feast to celebrate the winter solstice. After his time as a tree, he discovered that his old fear of the Shiha trainer had diminished. The cold dread he had felt in the Prathian Law Warden's presence had faded almost completely. He was a new man, and ready to make new beginnings. Thilmarius brought a small cart laden with bread and fresh butter to the feast. The Shiha had been over-enthusiastic in his baking, but no one complained. They ate roast pig and followed it with the surplus of side dishes that Kate and Lyra prepared. The bread was a perfect compliment, even if there was too much to finish. Albemarle was content, and while everyone wondered at the change, no one questioned it for fear of ending what they thought must be a temporary period of happiness. Sorelia watched it all, puzzled by their behavior. She had entered Albemarle only days before Tyrion's return, stealing the body of one of the slave mages to make it easy for her to move around without suspicion. Of course she wasn't the true Sorelia, she knew that. She was a mind twin and she periodically reported her news to her progenitor, who stayed well beyond the area around Albemarle. The body she inhabited had belonged to a woman named Tracy. She kept her memories, although they weren't very useful other than to further her disguise. The biggest difficulty she had was avoiding detection by those who had known the woman previously. Tracy had been a Galen, but since Sorelia had crushed her mind and stolen her body, she was no more, and neither was her gift. If anyone expected her to change form, it might arouse suspicion when she was unable to do so. The simple solution was to twin herself again, taking the bodies of those closest to her, but she was loath to do that. She dreaded the confrontation that would come when she eventually returned to her progenitor. The fewer of her that existed, the greater her chance would be of remaining the primary when the day of her reunion came. So she contented herself with subverting all the slaves who knew her gradually altering their minds and personalities without directly taking control. Over time, they became devoted to her, and she was certain that if the need arose, they would give their lives for her. She considered trying to take one of Tyrion's children, but discarded the idea. It was far too risky. Their minds were far more complex than the emotionally stunted former slaves, and their aether was blindingly strong. If she caught one by surprise, perhaps, but it would be a risky battle and likely to draw attention from the others. The most frustrating thing was the lack of information. She interrogated those she held sway over and picked at the surface thoughts of those she didn't, and yet she still found nothing noteworthy. Almost everyone in Albemarle was clueless as to what Tyrion's intentions were. There were interesting details, though. Some of the slaves had been involved in crafting numerous stasis boxes. She felt sure that was important but she had no idea how. The construction of the empty city was curious, but mundane. Tyrion's children knew more, but she dared not reveal herself by attempting to inspect them directly. Sorelia waited, reporting what she found and nothing more. Tyrion has done nothing since his return. He appears to be waiting for something, said Salandor. His youngest children are still there, asked one of the elders. Yes. We should act while we still can. Agreed, said the first among the Sentier elders. You will begin rolling the dice, Salandor. When the result is nine, you must act without delay. As you wish, elders, responded the Law Warden. The dice in question were a set of two decahedrons grown by one of the elders. Various numbers covered each face, 
and when rolled, they could be added together to produce a random number. Salendor rolled them as soon as he got back to his platform. Eleven, he murmured in disappointment. It would have to wait for another day. The possibilities have begun diverging rapidly, warned one of the Elenial elders. The Cynthia will move soon, but it is impossible to know when. How is this possible? questioned one of the younger ones. They use blind chance to confuse us. Clever, responded another. We should post guards. They would be noticed, and if the Cynthia know of them, they will plan for them. Bring the child here, then. They would not dare attack it within the grove itself. They might discover which child is critical to our plan if we do that. Bring them all, then. Tyrion would not allow that. We have tested the possibility already. We can bring only one, and it must be done in secret or they will discover our deception, stated the first elder. They have a spy there. How can it be done? The Prathians will assist. Lurliantha must be given instruction. I am afraid. Of what? asked the first. Death? We all must die, but by our actions our race will survive. Some day. Lurliantha had been gone a week and when she returned she had Thilmarius with her. She asked to speak to Tyrion and Kate privately. The three of them gathered in the bedroom that they shared. The elders want to meet your daughter, she began without preamble, looking at Kate. Why? asked Kate, suddenly suspicious. Why not your son? Layla has nothing to do with them. Tyrion understood the reason immediately. Layla is different. She may have inherited the Loshdi from me. So could Garlin, argued Kate. Why do they want to see my daughter? He shook his head. I believe they created it to pass only to the first child. Layla was conceived before Garlin. Garlin is the one that might have the special elenial gift of theirs. They should be more interested in him, he countered. Lyra's brows went up. She had not expected Kate to be aware of that detail. It wasn't something she had tried to hide, but neither had she made a habit of discussing it. They tell me that they wish to examine Layla's mind, to make sure the transfer of knowledge worked as intended. In adults, she nodded toward Tyrion, there are sometimes problems. Then they can come here to see her, insisted Kate. They cannot travel, reminded Lyra. I assure you that they mean no harm to your child. Kate changed tactics. Then they won't mind me coming with her. You would be able to do nothing, said Lyra. Let me go. I can commune with them during the process. You can trust that I will not allow them to do anything more than observe her. Tyrion remained silent. Don't you have anything to say in this? Kate challenged him. They know the consequences if they betray me, he said simply. I will be leaving Garlin with you, Kate, said Lyra sincerely. I trust no one in this world to love and care for him more than you. Layla means as much to me as he does. I will let no harm come to either of our children. Kate bit her lip. Fine. I don't like it, but I'll trust you, Lyra. They let Thilmaria enter after that and when the door opened again, only Kate emerged. The Prathian law warden used his gift to spirit Lyra, Tyrion, and little Layla away without anyone noticing. They didn't intend to make the trip public knowledge. Some of his children might notice Lyra's absence, but it might be a while before they realized that Kate's daughter was gone too, especially if Kate kept to herself for a while. Ironically, Bridget was the most likely to wonder, since she came to play with the children almost daily. Tyrion had no worries about her talking. Bridget was the least talkative of them all. Chapter 38 Seven days after Lyra left with Layla, Salindor looked down at the dice and smiled. The sum showing was nine. He immediately notified the Morden Crytek that was waiting for his message, and it vanished. It made two stops, one to the Morden Grove, the second to Sorelia's hidden position, several miles from Albemarle. And then things began to happen. Sarah looked askance at the men and women who entered through the main door to Tyrion's house. They were all slaves, but there was no reason for them to enter the house. What are you doing in here? she asked. Their response was immediate, powerful, and completely unexpected. Two of them, Prathians, vanished. The other six attacked her. Sarah didn't have her enchanted shield up. None of them did that. But she did have a small, more ordinary shield around herself. If their attacks had reached it before she reinforced it, she still would have died, though. 
She wasn't the fastest or most powerful of Tyrion's children, but she was no slouch either. Sarah saw their Aethar flare, and in that instant she threw her power into the shield. Their combined assault struck her defense, and just barely it held. With a word she activated her tattoos, and their enchantment sprang to life. A broad stroke of pure force sent her flying through the air. It wasn't an attempt to break her shield, merely to disorient her. Sarah still remembered the two that had vanished, and even as she hurtled toward the wall, she summoned an Aethar-filled mist to obscure the room. If she couldn't see all of them, then neither would they see her. She struck the wall hard, but her shield kept the impact from doing more than rattling her teeth. If one of her siblings had done that to her, it would have probably been strong enough to knock her senseless. Her enemies were weaklings. She snarled as adrenaline made her heart quicken. She would kill them all. Regaining her feet, Sarah stalked forward through the mist, following the wall to her right. She bumped into one of them almost immediately. The woman's reflexes were fast, and her arm blade made contact with Sarah's shield first. It didn't have the power necessary to penetrate, however. Sarah's return strike cut the woman neatly in two. Sounds on either side of her let her know that her scuffle had been noticed. They were trying to get to her before she could move again. With a brief effort of will, she lifted one of the heavy wooden chairs nearby and sent it sweeping sideways. It made contact with someone as she darted in the other direction. The man whose chest she ran into was much larger than she was. Ordinarily, that wasn't a factor in a battle between mages, but he managed to get his arms inside hers and force her back against the wall. With her arms forced outward, she had no way to attack him, and his physical strength was much greater than her own. He was pressing the point of his own arm blade into her chest, but so far the shield had resisted it. A number of options passed through her mind in an instant. The instinctive one was to use a blast of raw Aethar to send him flying backward, but then she'd still have to find and kill him afterward. A second possibility was to use her will to strengthen her muscles. She could probably overpower him then. But then her eyes fell on the tattoo at his neck. Uttering the command word, she watched him slump and fall dead at her feet. It wasn't a satisfactory way to win, but she was outnumbered, and she still had no idea what they were after. Stepping over the body, she moved forward, seeking her next opponent. It was too cold to have small children outside. That's what Bridget would have been told when she was little, but she had certain advantages her parents never had. There was snow on the ground, but Inara and Eldin never felt the chill of the air. She kept an envelope of warm air around each of them while they giggled and played with the snow. Of course, the warmth melted the snow much faster than simple gloves would have, but that was all right. Eldin delighted in watching it melt away almost as soon as he could grab it up. Even if he could have held it, he and his sister were far too small and uncoordinated to make it into anything recognizable, so Bridget took that task on for them. Using her Aethar, she scooped the snow up and formed it into fantastic shapes. She didn't have Violet's artistic skill, but she satisfied them with crude snow horses and other simple animals before switching to geometric shapes, cubes, squares, and ellipsoids. Inara was particularly entranced, watching raptly while Eldin spent half his time trying to grab the snow with his own hands. The man who walked toward them was big, larger than most, standing almost six and a half feet tall. Like many from the slave camps, he was covered with scars, a testament to the battles he had endured before becoming a warden. Because of his height, Bridget had noticed him before. She even remembered his name, Bolger. She nodded faintly at him as he walked closer intent on her snow-inspired games. They seemed inclined to watch them, and she was willing to ignore him until he stepped too close to Eldin. It was just beside the little boy, and that was too close for her taste. You need to move on, Bolger. Tyrion wouldn't like you getting too close to his children, she warned. He glanced at her calmly. Never got a chance to see many kids when I was in Baratreya. I don't mean him no harm. Leaning over, he patted Eldin gently, feeling the boy's soft hair. Two more strangers approached from the other direction, and Bridget turned her attention to them for a second, identifying them as more of the slaves that worked in and around Albemarle. The cracking sound that found her ears sent a shiver of cold horror down her spine. Olga's hand was around Eldin's neck, and the toddler's head hung loosely, drool falling from his lips as his eyes fluttered. Bridget was stunned, unable to believe her eyes, but that didn't stop her from reacting. An inarticulate howl rose from her throat, the cry of an animal that has lost something dear to it. Volga activated his tattoos, shielding himself and stalking toward Inara with one arm blade extended. 
Bridget's will lifted him from the ground, smashing him against the stone wall that formed the back of Tyrion's house. His shield held, but the force of the impact was so great that Bolga lost consciousness, blood running from his nose and ears. The shield vanished then, and the second time she slammed him against the wall broke his skull and most of the other large bones in his body. A lance of power shot forth from one of the two newcomers, aimed not at her but at Inara. It was deflected at the last moment by the enchanted chain that interposed itself. The shock and surprise that had slowed her initially was gone now as Bridget faced them, two women with crude features and brown hair. She didn't recognize these two. They looked much like most of the women who came from Elantrea, their noses bent and flattened from repeated breaks in the past. They were already shielded as they approached her. It was a mistake to give them tattoos, thought Bridget, but it never occurred to her to use the lethal ones inscribed on their necks. She stood between them and Inara, her own shield active and her chain moving closely around the girl to protect her. She wouldn't need it to kill them. Bridget glared at them, her eyes carrying a hatred so strong it seemed to make the air smolder. Burn! With that, the air around them ignited into incandescent flames. Their shields kept it out, but the heat was so intense it hardly mattered. Bridget was howling, and the fire she had created burned hotter with each passing second. She kept it up long after they collapsed, until they lost consciousness and their shields vanished. Then she incinerated the bodies. A greasy black cloud rose into the air, and there was nothing left but ash when she stopped. The blast of fire that caught her from behind was much weaker than hers had been. It washed over her shield and did little to her other than surprise her. There'd been no one there. A Prathian stood ten feet away now, revealed by the failed ambush. Bridget snarled, sending her chain out would she cut the upstart into five pieces in less than a second. Then she bent down to retrieve Inara, and saw what the fire had done. Unshielded, the girl had been blackened by the fire that had passed between the lengths of chain around her. Most of her skin was charred, and the damage to her lungs had left her unable to breathe. She writhed silently on the ground, dying even as Bridget watched, helpless. Bridget's cry of anguish was a small thing, too small to contain the horror and despair. It was limited by the constraints of her mortal frame, but the fury in her soul would not be bound by such things. She stood motionless for several minutes, while the ground beneath her vibrated with the intensity of her barely contained Aethar. And then she began to hunt, her chain following her like a hungry serpent. Kate was nursing Garlin when she heard a noise outside the bedroom. She didn't think much of it until she felt the heavy thump against the wall. The house was constructed of thick stone. The only blows that could be felt like that were powerful ones. Worried, but not yet fearful, she pulled Garlin from her breast and laid him in his crib. The crossbow Tyrion had given her years before still hung on the wall, along with the quarrel she had once used to kill one of the Shi-Ha. Taking it down, she tried to cock it but the strength in her arms wasn't enough. There was a stirrup on the front end of the bow to allow the user to brace it with a foot while drawing the string, but she knew that wouldn't be enough. A belt hung on the wall next to where the weapon had been. A hook attached to it was meant to attach to the string, allowing someone like herself to bend at the knees and then straighten up, using the strength of their legs to arm the bow. Lock the door first, she told herself. Still holding the crossbow, she marched toward the door but she stopped before reaching it. It began to move as someone drew the latch from the other side. Calm down, it's probably just Sarah come to explain the noise. As the door opened, however, she saw no one, and a strange mist billowed in from the other room. Adrenaline hit her like a bolt of lightning, as the more primitive portion of her brain recognized an unnatural threat. Kate slammed the weapon against the floor, and in one fluid motion set her foot in the stirrup and drew it back easily. Fear had given her the strength she lacked before. Setting the bolt in place, she leveled it at the doorway and fired at the vaguely human outline revealed by the mist. A man appeared, the quarrel buried deep in his chest. Gasping, he toppled over, dying rapidly. Close the door, she thought. Taking two steps, she moved to shove the stranger out of the way so she could close the entry. But a faint draft made her aware of the second invader a second later. Kate's head turned to look back toward the crib when the woman appeared behind her, and then she felt a blinding pain as the stranger's arm blade pushed through her lower back. It went through her kidney and emerged from her lower abdomen. She was falling. She never felt the impact. 
Time had become distorted, and desperation had narrowed her focus to one all-important goal, the baby. The woman's boots walked toward the crib. She was ignoring her now. Kate was dying. Her legs weren't working, but Kate pulled herself across the floor with her arms. The dead man was close, and she managed to get her hand on the bolt standing out from his chest. It didn't move at her first tug, but the second ripped it free. Her heart was pounding, giving her strength. The quarrel was ruined. The wooden shaft had splintered from the impact when it struck her target, and Kate knew she couldn't have cocked the crossbow again anyway. Lifting the heavy wooden weapon, she threw it across the room at the woman who had stabbed her. It flew low, hitting the woman in the legs and causing her to fall backward. She landed close, just within Kate's reach, and she slammed her fist, still holding the damaged crossbow bolt like a dagger into the woman's shoulder. The blow was poorly placed, however. The enchanted point went through her enemy's shield, but it failed to penetrate deeply. She was bleeding, but the wound wasn't serious. The crib had been overturned, though. The invader had grabbed it as she fell, sending poor Garlin tumbling across the floor, wailing in fear. He was near the bed. Kate pushed him under it as she rolled, trying to put her body between him and the stranger. Pain blossomed in her back as the woman's arm blade went through her once, twice, and then a third time. The world dimmed as Kate's eyesight failed, but her ears could still hear Garlin screaming as the other woman dragged him roughly from under the bed by one leg. Fyra, forgive me. Our baby and then she mercifully lost consciousness. Sarah burst in only seconds later, roaring like a beast as she came, only to see the stranger fling Garlin's limp body to the floor. He was already dead. The Prathian Major's shield was still down. The enchanted quarrel had broken it where Kate had stabbed her. Sarah's attack hit her like a battering ram built of fire and unholy violence. It ripped the woman in half and left what remained of her body charred beyond recognition. Silence reigned for a moment as Sarah stared at the wreckage that had been Tyrion and Kate's bedroom, her eyes taking in the bodies and the blood, absorbing the sight of things that could never be made whole again. Slowly she crumpled to the floor, keening with despair as her trembling fingers felt the savage cuts in Kate's body. Chapter 39 Ryan was in the empty city reconsidering the layout for an aqueduct when he heard the screams. He ignored the first one, so focused was he on his thoughts, but then a chorus of unholy wails rose to join the first one. Stepping out of the small workroom that served as his makeshift office, he glanced up and down the street. It was mostly empty, except for the work crew lifting massive blocks along one side. Twenty men and women, previously inhabitants of one of the Shihar slave camps, were using their Aethar to transfer the blocks one at a time from a massive sled to the partially completed wall of a building. They had stopped now, letting the stone settle where it was as they glanced at one another and then at him. Several shrugged. No one knew what the source of the screaming was. Violet poked her head out of a doorway across the way, where she had been working on a stone relief showing an idyllic pasture with sheep grazing. What's going on? she asked when she saw Ryan. I don't know, he replied, broadcasting his thoughts. Seconds later, his mage sight spotted the first fugitives, two men and a woman, running down the street behind the building he had just emerged from. They couldn't run very fast, though, for all three of them were limping, but they hobbled along as fast as they could manage. A flare of Aethar at the edge of his range struck one, and the woman went down, unmoving. The other two rounded the corner and came into view. One of them yelled a warning. She's gone insane! Both of them were bleeding from a profusion of cuts, particularly their legs. Then Bridget came into range, her Rathar blazing like a phoenix, her chain writhing in the air around her, restless and angry. She wasn't quite running, but her steps were quick, moving at a pace her wounded prey couldn't hope to match. Who? shouted one of the workers. Bridget, the raven-haired bitch! answered the other one. Neither stopped moving. If you want to live, run! Ryan stepped out, trying to block their path. Stop. Calm down and explain what's happening. They ignored him, panic on their faces as they split up to go around him. Bridget rounded the corner at that point, her eyes taking in the work crew. She fired two short blasts, killing the two she had been chasing. She had fresh targets, making the two she had been chasing obsolete. Bridget, stop! shouted Ryan mentally, but his psychotic sister ignored him. The workers watched her approach in fear and confusion, uncertain what was going on and looking to Ryan and each other for support. 
Pandemonium erupted when her chain blurred forward and cut three of them in two without pause. Brian was stunned by the sudden violence, and Violet ducked back into the building she had been working in. The workers scattered. Some tried to run, and others used their magic to lift the stones they had been using and hurl them at their unexpected antagonist. Bridget's enchanted chain spun, cutting down most of them who had dared to stand in front of her, while simultaneously she used her ether to catch the heavy stone blocks hurtling toward her. The stones slowed and then reversed course, smashing into the ones who had wisely decided to flee. Less than five seconds had passed, and most of his work crew was dead or dying. The only two left on their feet began to run, and Bridget watched them with an expression not unlike that of a cat, considering a toy. Her chain raced forward, hamstringing one leg on each of them. Then she slowed her pace to let them gain some ground. It took all of Ryan's resolve to step in front of her. Explain yourself, Bridget. Why are you doing this? If she recognized him, it didn't register on her face. The enchanted chain whipped toward his face, and if he hadn't interposed his metal hand, it would have taken his head from his shoulders. He managed to catch it as it pulled back for another strike, iron fingers clamping into place before it could slide away. That surprised her, but her will surged, and then he was flying into the air, pulled along with the weapon. He hung there awkwardly for a second as she prepared to whip the chain around and smash him into the ground, when Bridget suddenly paused, blinking. Bridget, stop! I'm your brother! She croaked something, but her voice was too hoarse for him to understand. Viola peeked out from the doorway. It's fine, Bridget. Don't hurt him. Bridget lowered him slowly to the ground, but he didn't release the chain. He felt it pull as she tugged at it with her will, but then she stalked toward him with dead eyes. Tell me what's going on, he insisted. She got close enough for him to understand her hoarse words. Let go or I'll cut that arm off and use it for a club. The other end of her chain twisted around to menace him. What happened? asked Violet, having finally emerged from her hiding place. Bridget's face twisted into a rictus of rage and agony. They killed the babies! They killed my babies! She yelled as she answered, but her voice had been ruined by screaming already, so it was still difficult to understand her. Ryan let go of the chain, and she began moving automatically, following the one she had wounded. Violet and Ryan stared at one another as she left. Neither made a move to stop her. We need to return, to find out what happened, he told her. What about Bridget? asked Violet, her eyes slightly wild. Do you want to try to stop her? No, she replied immediately. Me neither. Despite the bravery he had just displayed, his body was already trembling in reaction to what had happened. Death had stared him directly into his eyes, and for a moment he had been certain he was about to die. Together, the two of them began heading for the main house and dormitory where they lived. It was a fifteen-minute walk normally, so they jogged to speed up the journey. Halfway there they met Emma, Anthony, and Piper heading toward them. Bridget, asked Emma. She went that way, replied Ryan. What happened back there? Assassins. Some of the people from the slave camps killed the children, stated Emma flatly. Her voice was smooth, but he could see the emotional strain hidden behind her eyes. Which ones? asked Violet. All of them, answered Piper, her voice strident. Eight entered the main house, added Emma. Sarah killed most of them, but two got past her. Kate and Garlin were dead before she could get to them. Several others ambushed Bridget. They slew Inara and Eldin right in front of her. Violet's eyes grew round. No wonder. She is killing every one of the workers she can find, Ryan informed them. There's no stopping her. It doesn't make sense, said Emma. They knew they wouldn't survive the attacks, but they did it anyway. Even those hardened by the slave camps have a care for their own lives. We haven't exactly treated them well, observed Violet. They still have it much better here. We don't force them to fight, said Anthony. If they knew about what's planned, wondered Piper. They don't, insisted Ryan. And if they did, they wouldn't throw their lives away or target the children specifically. Emma glanced knowingly at Ryan. Then she said two words. The Sentier. It's possible, acknowledged Ryan, that we kept them entirely isolated. We don't really understand their capabilities, said Emma, and it's possible one could have snuck in, hidden amongst the newer slaves. Anyone here could be an assassin, then, concluded Ryan. Except us, said Anthony. Right? That's not an established fact, said Emma, but we have to assume so. If they had turned one of us, they wouldn't need to settle for something like this. One of us could kill the others by surprise and then do whatever he or she wished. I hate to say it, Piper put in. But Bridget might have the right idea. There were at least four thousand workers here, said Violet, horrified. Emma nodded. 
Bridget can't kill them all. Violet was shaking her head. You didn't see her a few minutes ago. She looked perfectly capable of taking on an army. That's beside the point, offered Ryan. If she charges around killing them, she'll start a panic. Then we'll be running in every direction. We can't track them down if they run away. Even if they don't realize it, the tattoos on them have a limited range. Are you proposing what I think? asked Emma. Better if we put an end to them quickly before they escape or worse, before the next group of hidden assassins tries to kill someone else. You want us to spread out and activate the kill tattoos one at a time? That'll take forever even if all of us do it, objected Anthony. The others are back at the main house watching over Sarah. She was pretty distraught after finding Kate and Garlin, noted Emma. One of us could go back and mobilize them. The sooner we start, the sooner we finish. Just tell them to fan out and try to stop anyone from leaving, Ryan told them. He tapped one section of the runes engraved on his arm. I created a set of master runes that can do the job more efficiently. How? asked Anthony. They allow me to activate the lethal tattoos on any of the slaves within my range simultaneously. Emma looked at him in surprise. What's the range? Roughly half a mile, I think, said Ryan. Obviously, I've never wanted to test it before. Turning away, he walked back in the direction Bridget had gone, where the largest concentration of workers would be found. I'll walk a pattern through the city and then back to Albemarle. It should be finished in a few hours. Violet shivered at the thought, but Emma was more practical. What about the ones we prepared? They're in stasis boxes. They'll be safe, Ryan assured her. The others looked at Emma, still expecting orders from her. With Tyrion absent, she was the obvious choice. Spread out, head for the edges of the settlement. Make sure none escape. I'll go back and get the others to help. And then Ryan began his march, stretching out his senses. Whenever his mage sight made contact, he touched the spot on his arm and sent out a pulse, massacring every one of the slaves that came within his reach. Thousands died, and most never knew their deaths were coming before it was over. The only small mercy to be found that day was that he got to the majority of them before Bridget did. It was late in the afternoon when he found Bridget. She had cornered a small group within one of the newly finished residential buildings. Since he was still outside, he couldn't see her with his eyes, but he could tell by the fluttering of her fading aether that she was close to collapse. Her chain dragged the ground beside her, only animating briefly when she used it to kill. Sending out another pulse, he slew the last of her prey. Then he went inside to find his sister. Bridget stood uncertainly in the largest room, her eyes unfocused and tired as she stared around herself, wondering what had happened. When Ryan entered, her head jerked toward him. What did you do? she rasped. They're all dead, Bridget. There's no one left to kill he told her. You stole them from me, she accused. It's over. Her eyes glared daggers at him, but then her knees sagged and she slumped to the floor. She was so fatigued she should have passed directly into unconsciousness, but her eyes remained open, staring blankly along the floor. As her anger faded, tears began to run from them. Ryan went to her and bent down, slipping his arms beneath her shoulders and knees. She flinched away from his touch, but she no longer had the strength or will to resist. Straightening his back and knees, he lifted her, cradling her slender form against his chest. Bridget cried openly for several minutes as he walked, but by the time he had carried her home, she had fallen into a troubled slumber. Chapter 40 Tyrion was bored. It was a problem he was well acquainted with. During his days as a slave, boredom had been his constant companion. Even later, when he had lived alone with Lorelliantha, it had been common. But the last few years had been full of activity. He looked up with anticipation when Bayavar appeared. You look healthy, he said, greeting the Illineal Law Warden in his native Aerolith. Learning the language had been the way he had first spent his time with Bayavar. And your accent is flawless now, complimented the Illineal. I fear that I have dark news to bring you. Tyrion was already on his feet. Is Lena all right? It isn't your child, or Loreliantha either, said Bayavar, shaking his head. Something has happened in the place where you live. His anxiety grew. What have they done? We just received a message from your daughter, Emma. There's been an attack. Tyrion's eyes narrowed. A message? Why not tell me sooner? If something was about to happen, your elders would know it before any message reached us. Bayavar looked embarrassed. The elders move slowly, and I am not told much, 
This is the first I have learned of it. Your wife and Kate. Your wife and three of your youngest children are dead, finished the law warden. The words washed over him, and as they passed his ears, the world seemed to turn grey, as if all the colour had leached from it. Bayavar's voice came to him from a great distance, echoing through an empty void. Tyrion remained still while his mind calculated. Three youngest children. That would be Garlin, Inara, and Elden. And Kate. Never forget Kate. What will Lyra say when she learns the news? How can I face Kate with the death of her children? His mind stopped. No, Kate's dead. Bayavar was still talking, but he could no longer hear him. In one swift motion, Tyrion whipped his fist forward, putting his shoulder behind it. The Illinial Shi'ar hit the wooden platform as he went down, completely unconscious. You evil bastards, said Tyrion, looking down on the insensible Shi'ar. You fucking knew that's why we're here, to protect their plan and everything else be damned. What about Kate? What about Inora and Eldin? What about Garlin? He was gripped by an urge to kill Bayavar, even as the man began to twitch, his eyes fluttering open, unfocused. Tyrion restrained himself, drawing on some reserve he hadn't known existed. He felt strangely calm, considering what he'd just heard. I feel nothing. Bayavar groaned. Where are Lyra and our baby? he demanded. It took the Shihar a moment to answer, but he finally managed the words. They are on their way here. Did she know? Did Lyra know about this before we came? Of course she didn't know, he thought to himself, but he had to ask. He had to be sure. No, said Bayavar. I didn't know. She didn't know. The elders tell us little that isn't required. His words were slurred as they passed his swollen lips. Tyrion stared into space, motionless, and feeling for all the world exactly like a statue. He was utterly dead inside. You have to believe me, Tyrion, insisted the groggy law warden. He answered him in a monotone. I do, or you would be dead already. In the days to come you may wish I had slain you here and now, though. In the distance he sensed Lyra's hurried approach. She was carrying Layla in her arms. He went to meet her. Have you heard? he asked her. She looked worried. No, they told me something had happened and to find you. What is it? How would she react? How could he tell her that her only child was dead? Lorelliantha had always been cool, calm and level-headed like all of her people, but she was also the first of her kind to fall in love, to have a family. Tyrion stared at her, numb and unable to formulate a sentence. Eventually his mouth opened, as if on its own. They're dead. Her features grew concerned. Who? Who's dead? Our baby. Garlin, Kate, Inara, and Elden, he answered, the names tumbling from his mouth like hard stones, and with each one he saw her register the impact, as if someone was striking her in the stomach. Lara's eyelids fluttered, and tears spilled out. Her mouth opened and closed. That's not true, is it? She said at last, her voice halting uncertainly over each phrase. This is some strange joke. It can't be true. He couldn't bear to look at her, so he cast his eyes downward. Why have I just told me? No, insisted Lyra. The elders would have known. They wouldn't let this happen. Her arms tightened as she spoke, squeezing Layla uncomfortably. The baby began to cry. I saved the ones they needed. He rasped, finding it difficult to speak. That's why we're here. They needed us. They need Layla. Everyone and everything else is expendable to them. A growling noise rose from her throat, or perhaps it was a partly strangled scream, but it made Layla begin to cry even harder. Lyra stopped, visibly taking control of herself and stroking Layla's cheeks with her trembling hands. Shh, baby. It's all right. I didn't mean to frighten you. Perhaps I should hold her, he suggested. No, said Lorelliantha, more forcefully than necessary. Let me. This is all that's keeping me together right now. She looked around, struggling to find something to rest her eyes upon. Eventually she gazed upward, letting the tears run down her cheeks and neck as she fought to keep from shaking too hard. After a minute, she added, We're going home now. Yeah. The walk back wasn't much more than an hour under normal circumstances. 
but they went slowly, and the trip wound up taking closer to two. When they arrived, Albemarle seemed strangely quiet. The gate guards were gone. In fact, there was no one visible anywhere. Though once they entered the house, they found Abby and Sarah sitting together in the front room. Both looked as though they had been crying, and Sarah in particular seemed distraught. Where is she? asked Tyrion. Sarah choked on her reply, but Abby managed to answer. In the bedroom. They started for it, but Abby cautioned. Don't go in there. You don't want to see it. They ignored her warning. Lyra handed Layla to Abby, and then they went in anyway. There was blood in the doorway, blood on the floor, and even a small amount on the bedding. It pooled on the floor beneath where Kate's body lay, as well as under one of the strangers. The second attacker had died a fiery death, and that body hadn't bled much. At first, neither of them said a word as they silently took in the scene. But when Lyra picked up Garland's tiny, broken body, her restraint vanished. She cried in a way that Tyrion had never heard from her before, emitting loud, sobbing cries as her chest heaved and her lungs fought for air. Tyrion could do nothing for her. Kneeling, he stroked the hair from Kate's cold face. I feel nothing. The words repeated themselves in his mind, and for once they seemed true. He was dead, through and through. Then his eyes spied something clutched in Kate's hand. He pulled her hand over to examine it, immediately recognizing the enchanted crossbow bolt. She had used it to kill the man by the door, and she must have pulled it free to stab the other one. Kate had fought with everything she had, trying vainly to protect Lyra's baby. And it wasn't enough, he thought, staring at the sadly inadequate enchanted quarrel. I left her here, and this is all she had to use. And then the dam broke, releasing a tide of anguish and pain so great that it swallowed him. Tyrion cried, and his body shook. Lyra came to him, still carrying her dead baby, and the two of them held each other as they wept. Sometime later, when they had finally fallen silent again, Lyra asked him, You're going to do something, aren't you? Yeah. You're going to kill them? Yeah. All of them? Everyone that had anything to do with this, he replied. That includes the Illineal Grove, she said matter-of-factly. You know that, right? He looked up at her with red eyes. I do. Good. Chapter 41 What do we know? asked Tyrion. They were gathered in the council hall, and for the first time since it had been finished, Tyrion was the one sitting in the seat that had been named for him. Everyone who remained, David, Ashley, Sarah, Abby, Ian, Violet, Piper, Tad, Antony, Emma, Ryan, Bridget, Lyra, and even tiny Layla, was present. They were the only ones left alive in Albemarle and its environs. Ryan and Bridget had slain all the mages who had come from the slave camps, with the exception of those already in storage within stasis boxes. Emma began. With certainty, only that eleven of the slaves were turned against us. Eight entered the main house, six of those distracted Sarah, while two others slew Kate and Garlin. The last three approached Bridget while she played with Inara and Eldin. The two children were slain while she faced them. No, interrupted Bridget. Eldin died before I did anything. I should never have let him get so close. What's done is done, said Tyrion. I'm not interested in what-ifs and might-have-beens. All that matters now is what we do from this point forward. Does anyone know why the assassins did what they did? They threw away their lives, answered Emma. The only reasonable explanation I can come up with is that a centaur must have turned their heads inside out. Did our centaur mages have any contact with them? asked Tyrion. Ian shook his head. No, they were kept separate. The only people they were allowed contact with were Piper and myself. Where are they now? Dead, announced Bridget. I took care of them first. And the rest of the slaves? asked Tyrion. Also dead, responded Ryan. Bridget and I eliminated them. Tyrion studied Bridget for a moment, before asking, Whose decision was it to kill all of them? Bridget's mouth started to open, but Emma spoke over her. 
Mine. We couldn't be sure how many of them had been manipulated. He looked at Bridget. You were about to say something. Only that I agreed with her, and I would have preferred to do the job alone, answered Bridget sullenly. It would have been helpful to have saved a few to interrogate, noted Tyrion. You think I made the wrong choice, said Emma, her chin firm. I won't second guess you. Under the circumstances, I doubt I would have been sane. I might have run amok, killing everyone I could find. He glanced at Bridget knowingly for a second. Having Ryan put a quicker end to things was probably a better choice. We still don't know how they subverted our servants, put in Ryan. Lyra spoke then, her voice soft to avoid disturbing the baby in her arms. The Sentier might have sent an agent in among some of the newer slaves. Abby broke her silence. Ultimately, however, we have no proof of anything, and we have destroyed any witnesses that might have provided proof. We don't need proof, said Tyrion coldly. There is no court of justice. Are those in stasis still secure? Ryan nodded. Yes. How many do we have? Ryan answered. 723 prime for the final phase. More than half of those are Morden. All have been given instructions on what to do when they're awakened. Another 500 were put in stasis before them when we were short of living space. These are not primed, but given the timing, it's unlikely that they were subverted by the Sentier. Tyrion nodded. And how many Morden do we have who can be used? Only five, said Ryan. Of course, only Brangor knows the locations that you selected for Emma and yourself, since Jordan did not return. Wake them, ordered Tyrion. Brangor can show them the locations first. After that, we can make use of them transporting the civilians. Sarah broke in. The people of Lincoln and Cole aren't ready. They will be, said Tyrion. I've decided to change the plan sequence. When the sky gets dark and the air gets cold, they'll beg us for shelter. Is that safe? questioned Abby, looking concerned. You always intended to protect them first. Tyrion's expression was grim. No, it isn't. I don't know for certain how bad it'll be. But I do know that the Sentier will be watching us closely. They need something better to focus on. If they see us transporting the entire civilian population immediately after what happened here, they might decide to do something else. I intend to take the initiative before they have the chance. Let me do the first one, Father, begged Emma, her face sombre. They started this on my watch. Tyrion locked eyes with her. If anyone had been wronged the most, if anyone had the right, it was him. He wanted to do it, but the dark despair that he saw in her made him reconsider. A tense minute passed before he gave her his answer. You know which one to do first. Emma's eyes flashed. I do. Take Brangor and the other Morden. Have him show them the other teleport sites first, then send them back, he told her. Ryan, you and Bridget will go as well. You make sure Emma doesn't lose control. Bridget, you'll make sure they survive. The three of them stood. Yes, father. Tyrion stared directly at Bridget. This isn't the day for your personal revenge. Kill no one unless it is necessary. Draw no attention to yourself or them. She growled, but nodded affirmatively. Take a Prathian with you as well, he said, addressing Emma. She smiled. I was going to do that anyway. After everyone had left, Lorelianthe asked him, What are they going to do? She had never been privy to his plans before. Shake the foundations of the world, he told her. Was she successful? asked one of the Sentier elders. I believe so reported Salandor. Sorelia's attack was sudden and unexpected. Three of his youngest children were almost certainly killed. Almost certainly? Her servants died before they were able to relay the results to her, but judging by the response, they must have been successful. Tyrion's older children slaughtered every Barati in the area. Was the correct child among the three? asked the first of the Sentier elders. Yes, responded Salandor. The Elonials took one child out before the attack. Loreliantha was caring for it, but the child actually belonged to Tyrion's human mate. We think it was a ruse meant to confuse us. Then Loreliantha's child was one of those slain. Yes. Sorelia has done well, noted the first. Have her confirmed the deaths before she... What was that? asked a different elder. The ground had jumped, and then the earth shook again. Bridget had been disappointed when they found no one at the hot springs near the Sentier Grove. 
but she kept her irritation in check. Things were finally happening. Whether it was today or another day, she knew she would soon get what she desired. She had lost sight of that for a while, distracted by... Don't think about that. She reined her thoughts in sharply. She might lose control if she let herself think about them. Keep it together, Bridget, Ryan told her. I can't watch both of you at the same time. Don't worry about me, she responded. I only wish I could do this instead of her. She waved her hand at where Emma was reclining, her eyes already closed. Emma heard neither of them. Her mind was already in another place. She had changed, and this time it was a relief. Her inner pain and torment had faded, becoming almost insignificant within the greater being that she was an integral part of. Releasing the pressure, the molten magma and gas that was pent up in the earth near her would be easy. It was already unstable, and her touch upon it in the recent past had only made it more unstable. But it wasn't enough. The Sentier Grove was close, but the elders had not taken root in the caldera itself. They would be shaken, and some would be damaged. But she wanted something more, and that would require some finesse. Moving carefully, she began rearranging herself, reinforcing some areas, those closest to where the humans were, and relaxing others. She guided the hotter parts of herself, shepherding the magma and pressure to older chambers which had been dormant for much longer, areas that lay deep beneath parts of the Sentier Grove. When that was done, she fractured her skin, breaking the restraints imposed by layers of ancient bedrock. Her body shook with something that was neither pleasure nor pain, but something greater. At long last, the earth's ancient heat was free, and the world exploded with her rage. It was with great reluctance that she listened to the tiny human voice that was calling to her, urging her to return. When Emma finally collapsed into herself, she opened her eyes to darkness and confusion. She was inside a small bubble, a shield of intense strength, formed by both Bridget and Ryan. The two of them were holding hands, their minds interlinked to allow them to focus their efforts. Brangor sat beside her. The Morton's voice was close to panic when he announced, She's awake! Emma's mage sight searched the area beyond the shield, but she found only chaos. They had somehow fallen, dropping hundreds of feet into the earth, far below the area where she had first closed her eyes and begun to listen. Beyond that, the ground was shaking and heaving for as far as her senses could explore. Get us out of here! Ryan ordered. The world beyond the shield vanished, replaced by blue skies and snow-covered ground. They were standing in the street outside the council building. Abby was waiting for them as they walked up the steps. Emma and Ryan would be reporting to Tyrion immediately. How did it go? Abby asked them as they passed. Emma and Ryan shrugged without stopping, but Bridget paused. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Beautiful? Bridget nodded. I don't understand what she did or how she did it, but the world just seemed to come apart. Everything I could see, everything I could sense for as far as my range extended was torn apart. The ground shook, and then it collapsed beneath us. The smoke was too dense to see through with your eyes, the air too toxic to breathe, and that was the part near us. I think it was worse, much worse for the Sentier Grove. Her eyes were wrapped with enthusiasm as she spoke. Abby's tone was flat as she responded. It sounds awful. Dangerous is the word, said Bridget. We almost died. It took everything we had to keep ourselves alive. If we hadn't left when we did, we would have died from lack of air or been cooked by the heat. It was rare for Bridget to talk much or with such vivacity. Abby was puzzled by her reaction. You sound as if you enjoyed it. Bridget smiled. Just when I thought the world was empty of joy, I saw a miracle. How many more times do we get to do this? Her sister shuddered. Six. I think. Chapter 42 Thilmerius entered Albemarle with a heavy heart. He had heard the news about Tyrion's family, and worse, the latest reports regarding what had occurred at the Sentier Grove's most populous territory. It was a region almost on the other side of the world, so he didn't give much credence to the suppositions put forth by some that Tyrion had somehow caused the eruption but he also knew that his opinion wouldn't matter. The Sentier would respond whether it was true or not. The Law Warden was worried by the lack of guards, the lack of anyone, really. Tyrion City was empty, and Albemarle was barely more occupied. The tiny numbers of humans he met 
All of them Tyrion's direct descendants wouldn't be able to put up even a token resistance when the inevitable retribution came. One of the daughters met him when he drew near to the original house. She seemed apprehensive, but she offered to find her father for him. He recognized her face, but had never learned her name. Wait here, she told him, directing him to a chair in the front room of the house. He's busy, but he will come as soon as he can. What is he doing today? asked Thilmerius. But the young woman didn't answer, though she had clearly heard the question. She backed out of the room and closed the door. A half hour passed before it opened again. When it did, Tyrion was there, his face grim. He took the seat across from Thilmerius, but he didn't speak. I have news for you, began the Law Warden. Tyrion nodded, but said nothing. The Sentir Grove, the larger portion of it that lies on the other continent, has suffered a disaster, Thilmerius informed him. Tyrion gave no sign of surprise or pleasure. There was a volcanic event, continued the Law Warden, on a scale that is hard to imagine. The ancient humans called them supervolcanoes, and there was one that lay near to their grove there. How bad was it? asked Tyrion. More than half the grove was destroyed, said Thilmerius. The remaining half will suffer from the aftermath for years to come. A tragedy, I'm sure, observed Tyrion blandly. The Prathian leaned forward. Not just for them. An event that size will have far-reaching consequences for the weather. Which won't be a problem for us, thought Tyrion smugly. Pardon me, Thilmerius. Three of my children were murdered very recently. I have little energy left for compassion or to worry about a change in the wind. Your people rely on crops to feed themselves, do they not? queried the Law Warden. This winter may last much longer than usual, and the summer that follows could be stunted and brief. Tyrion already knew that, but he didn't intend to give that fact away. That would be a serious problem. I wanted to offer my help, should things become difficult. The Prathian Grove could help make up for the shortage, should your crops fail. What do you care? asked Tyrion bluntly. So a few of us starve. That makes little difference to the Shi'ar, doesn't it? Thilmerius frowned. I know you dislike me, but I still would try to make up for past wrongs. We have discussed this before. I care dearly for the future between our two races. Yet the Elenials were not concerned enough to help protect my children two days ago, accused Tyrion. Do you think I don't realize what they could have done? I am not an Elenial, but your people are their closest allies. Doesn't that put an equal share of the blame on your shoulders? We were not given that information, Tyrion. If we were, I would have acted on it, said the Law Warden emphatically. I understand your bitterness, but you have to believe that. I don't know the plan of the Elenials. We do support them, but they tell us little. If I had known, plan or no plan, I would have done something. Tyrion leaned back in his chair, looking down his nose at the Prathian. So what are you here for now? What can you do? Offer us bread when our crops fail? That won't be enough. It isn't just that, insisted Thilmerius, growing exasperated. The Sentir will suspect you of having something to do with the disaster. Since they murdered my wife and children, suggested Tyrion. Do I take your statement as confirmation that they were behind it? Thilmerius blanched. I have no proof of that, but... But you know it to be true, spat Tyrion, leaning forward suddenly. And now that some natural disaster has spoiled their precious lands, you come to relieve some of your guilt by warning me. Do you think we can face an attack from them if we are forewarned? If they come to take the lives of the rest of my family, what can we do? How many crytakes do you think they will send? The Elenials will do exactly as they please, barked Tyrion. If, if it suits their plan, they'll intervene. If it doesn't, then they'll happily watch us bleed and die. Whatever happens, it'll be what they wished for, just as it's always been. There are other options, said Thilmerius. Fighting would be foolish, I agree, but you could hide your family. Bring them to the Prathian Grove. No one finds a Prathian who does not wish to be found. No. Don't let stubborn pride be the death of your people, begged the Law Warden. If you truly wish to aid us... Send your Crytek here. Let them guard us. Better still come yourself. Learn what it is to risk your own blood. Tyrion's eyes bored into the Shi'ar. Tyrion, this is foolish. I will not leave my home. Thilmerius tried one more time. Surely you can see that this... Tyrion stood. I am tired, Lord Warden. 
and I have a long winter to prepare for. Thank you for your warning. Bowing his head, Thilmarius left. Once he had gone, Emma entered the room. Tyrion had left the privacy ward down so she could eavesdrop. Are you sure that was wise, father? she asked. What better guardians against a foe that might teleport in to strike at any point than those who cannot be seen, he replied. We don't know that the Morden will assist them, she countered. They will, and it'll be a delight to watch them kill one another. A pointless battle, she observed. I have few entertainments left. Besides, we can't move until the people of Colne and Lincoln have been safely stored. If Thilmarius is correct, the Sentier might respond sooner than we desire. Better to have a strong defence. Get plenty of rest tonight. We begin moving them tomorrow. Most of Colm came voluntarily, if reluctantly. When Sarah had brought the news that they needed to relocate immediately, they had balked, since her anxious command was nothing like the pleasant invitation they had received before. Tyrion appeared the next day, alone, and walked the streets. He went from door to door, speaking to heads of family households and generally spreading his message, move or he would move them. He did nothing to couch his demand as a request or anything genteel. He didn't beg, plead, or debate. He merely told them he would return in two days, and he expected them to be on the road when he did, if they hadn't arrived at the meeting point near Albemarle already. Belongings were to be left behind, they were to bring only what they could carry. Given his violent history in Colm, only two families refused to leave. How do we handle them? asked Sarah during her report to him in the council chamber. Send Bridget and twenty of the newly awakened slaves, he replied. Sarah was aghast. Bridget! The look on his face was cold. I consider that merciful. Would you rather I send Ian? She shuddered. No. What of Lincoln? he asked. I've not seen any of them in the arrivals. Sarah cast her eyes downward. She had been the one to go to Lincoln and demand the move. None of them have come. Did you check on them? Yesterday, she answered. They were very clear in their dismissal. Did you make an example of any of them? No, sir. Tyrion sighed. Well, there's not enough time for that now. Send the rest of the slave mages to round them up. The five Morden we have can begin teleporting them here in batches. That will cause a panic, Sarah protested. You should have considered that when you were being diplomatic, he said, his voice harsh. She blanched. There are more than ten thousand people living in or near Lincoln. Who will be dead soon if we don't hurry, he finished for her. Unless you delay, she suggested. An extra week would enable us. Tyrion lifted a finger, silencing her with the gesture. There was violence in his aura. Gone was the newly gentle man who had returned a few months ago. This was the man who had kidnapped her once, years past. The man who had taught her to fight and kill. The man who wouldn't hesitate to punish disobedience with pain so intense it made one wish for death. We will move them now. Dismissing her with his eyes, he looked toward Ian, who sat silently at the table. You will be in charge of bringing them here. Use whatever methods you prefer. Just make sure they get here alive. Ian stood, smiling. Certainly, father. He had been discarded and distrusted by his siblings for so long that he hadn't expected to receive any meaningful instructions ever again. We only have a few hundred slaves to use. It may be difficult to accomplish without injuring some of them. Most of his children kept their expressions carefully neutral, though Abby and Sarah didn't bother hiding their disgust. Sarah swallowed, forcing her anger down. I'll go with him. She could at least moderate her sadistic brother's behavior. You'll be needed here, keeping our voluntary evacuees calm while we separate and store them in groups, he told her. Sarah glanced at Emma, hoping to find support from the only other person in the room who might have some authority. But her sister turned her eyes away. Chapter 43 Sorelia watched and waited. Her spellbeast brought her frequent reports, linking directly with her mind to show her what they had witnessed. Most of them were tiny, finch-sized flying creatures that would be hard for even a mage to spot, so long as they stayed a few hundred yards distant. The slaughter of Tyrion's Barati servants made her job much more difficult, and since he and his children weren't allowing anyone new into the area, she couldn't insert a new spy, forcing her to use this cruder method of gathering information. She had yet to see anything that suggested he might have been involved in what happened at the Centaur Grove, but the events of the past few days were highly suspicious. One of the Prathian law wardens had visited, 
and the day after he had begun transporting large numbers of wildlings. But why? she wondered. The numbers were boggling. Thousands had arrived in one day, only to vanish into the city he had been building. But they weren't there now. Now there were more arriving, teleported to the same area in groups of twenty. New groups arrived every few minutes, only to enter some of the buildings and disappear. What is he doing with them? Doing a rough calculation in her head, she realized he had bought in somewhere between two and three thousand people that day already, and that was on top of the much larger group that had arrived under their own power the day before. They were powerless and lacking any useful weapons. Even if they'd been mages, they wouldn't have been a real threat. What could ten or twenty thousand helpless humans be used for? They would be useless as soldiers. She continued to send her reports home. It wasn't her job to judge. Another two days passed, and the number of people arriving slowed dramatically. Dutifully, she reported that as well, and then she got a response from Salendor. Stretching out her hand, she accepted the tiny spell beast on her palm, and then began absorbing the information stored in its tiny mind. Her mentor's voice played silently for her. There have been new volcanic eruptions, one on the southern continent in a desert region, and a second near the smaller portion of the Morden Grove. There was no significant damage, but their combined effect will likely produce a drastic effect on the climate. The elders believe Tyrion's actions to be responsible. It is clear now that he is moving to shelter the wildlings. The ash from these events will darken the skies, possibly forcing some of the elders into a dormant state for a time. Even after the sunlight recovers, the gases released will trigger a vicious winter that may last years, stunting growth. The elders fear what he may be planning to do during such a period. Their response will be swift and decisive. The Barati threat is to be eliminated tomorrow. Sorelia's eyes widened as she processed the information. The last line of his message could mean only one thing. The Crytek would arrive soon. Tyrion stood in the square in front of the council building, watching. He felt a constant tension, a pressure, to be doing something, anything, to speed up the process. There was nothing for him to do, though, other than look menacing. Everyone moved a little faster when they saw him, but it wasn't a very satisfying job. They had grown tired of seeing fear in people when they looked at him years ago. They had just gotten used to it, and whenever things started happening, it turned out to be too useful to give up. The sky dimmed for a moment, and he looked up, wondering for a moment if the ash had finally reached them. That was just a normal cloud, however, passing in front of the sun. Tyrion turned his eyes back to the people in the square, disappointed. The latest eruption had been the closest to them so far, but it had still been several hundred miles to the west. That was close enough they would probably see some of the ash fall eventually, but he wasn't sure of the wind movement. Most of it might fall elsewhere. Of course, it didn't matter if they saw any of the ash at all. That was merely an added benefit. The ash would be a nuisance to the areas it landed in, but it was the less noticeable gases from the eruptions that would do most of the damage. What he had learned of volcanic eruptions and the weather was interesting, but he didn't really know how severe the consequences of his plan might turn out to be. The Shiha studies of weather were largely theoretical. The knowledge they had gained from the ancient humans had been far more practical but he had no way to use that knowledge in a meaningful way. He was operating purely on guesswork. Besides, no one had ever seen a volcanic eruption of the magnitude that Emma had caused, much less seven of them. It might even trigger an ice age, he thought. He didn't think that lightly, though. From what he had learned, the sulfur dioxide and other aerosols wouldn't stay in the atmosphere more than a few years. But he didn't know for certain what the long-term effects might be. It was all a giant gamble to nearly destroy the world, like the farm wife who burns down her own home to rid it of mice. A flash of Athar signaled the latest arrival. There had been so many over the last few days that he hardly noticed. His eyes were open, but long seconds passed before he registered what he was seeing. The group standing in the middle of the square wasn't another group of civilians. Ian was the closest, since he was there to direct the arrivals. Only chance saved him, for he stumbled when the first blast of Aethar ripped through the space above, where his head had just been. Most of the other people close to the landing point were not so lucky. People screamed and fell as the Crytek leveled everything near their location, using blasts of raw Aethar. 
I followed those attacks with spell-woven battle magics, long lethal vines of energy that could be manipulated at will. They stripped flesh from bone wherever they touched human bodies. More flashes of Aethar registered in Tyrion's mind as more Crytek arrived, appearing in spots scattered across the once empty city. Ian's situation was dire. Everyone within ten feet of the landing platform was already dead. He was just beginning to react, his mind still struggling to catch up to reality. He had activated his runes, shielding himself, but even that defense would be inadequate as the Crytek turned to focus their efforts on him. Wake up, boy! shouted someone in Ian's ear, and then he was pushed sideways, out of the path of several of the spell-woven vines that were now orienting on his position. Tyrion went over him as he sprawled, leaping into the enemy like a hunting cat that had finally found its prey. His arm blades cut away the disorganized tendrils that reached for him, and then he was among them. It was too many to face alone, or at least that's what a rational mind would have advised. But Tyrion's mind had gone silent already, replaced by the coldly calculating battle mind that had been his constant companion during his years in the arena. Being outnumbered was always a disadvantage, but in that early instant he had seen that his foes were still crowded together, shoulder to shoulder on the platform they had teleported onto. Their movements were limited as a result, for they didn't want to hurt their allies, but Tyrion had no such compunctions limiting him. His arm blades tore through their shields, and then through arms, legs, heads, and other appendages too strange to name. The Crytek came in a wide variety of bizarre forms. Those that had survived his initial onslaught tried to scatter, but a square shield appeared just beyond the edge of the platform, and then, in the span of a heartbeat, it compressed inward violently, knocking them back towards Tyrion's waiting blades. Off balance, they were easy prey. Tyrion dismissed the shield and looked around. All those nearest him were dead, but others had appeared all throughout the city. Where's Antony? he asked. Antony had been standing on the other side of the platform. He spotted the young man's still form before Ian could say anything. He had died in the first blast, before any of them had been able to react. Find Violet, he ordered Ian, pointing toward the building she had been working in. Get back to the main house with her. What about? Ian's eyes were wide as he gestured around them with his arms. Them! Tyrion didn't know if he was referring to the Crytek or the civilians they were slaughtering, not that it mattered. We've saved as many as we can. Don't go out of your way to fight them, you aren't good enough. Get Violet, get to the house. Ian started running, and Tyrion went in the opposite direction, looking for Tad and Bridget. They hadn't been far away. If they were still alive, he'd know soon enough. He ran two blocks and reached the other landing platform, but they weren't there. From the bodies around it, it appeared that most of the Crytek that showed up at the platform were dead. More had appeared not far off, though, and he could sense fighting in a nearby building. They were inside, killing Crytek as they attempted to enter the building, but the extended battle was drawing reinforcements from other areas. While Bridget fought the ones entering the front, Tad struggled to keep up with those coming through the windows and the back door. Tyrion fell on those entering from the front since they were the larger group. They were so intent on their attempt to enter that they failed to sense the threat coming from their rear. Half were dead before they realized he was among them. The other half died when they tried to retreat, Bridget's chain weaving a deadly path through them. In the brief pause that followed, he spoke. Get Tad, we have to return to the house. The people? She asked, arching one brow curiously. We've done all we can. These can no longer be saved. There are twenty in the building with us, she informed him. They had been protecting them. How noble, he thought. He started to order her to abandon them but then he realized they might be useful. Circle around to the back. Give the ones back there something better to do. I'll get Tad and bring the others out. We'll take them with us. She left without hesitation, her lean figure running gracefully, her chain circling her tightly as she went. Tyrion found Tad inside, and together they gathered up the group they were sheltering. Bridget was back at the front of the building by the time they emerged, smiling. Tyrion's mage sight found no evidence of anything living near the house but by the smile on his daughter's face, he knew there wouldn't be. We're running for my house in Albemarle. Stay together and don't fall behind. He pointed up the road in the direction he meant, since most of them were unfamiliar with the area. Go! He put a hand on Bridget and Tad's shoulders, forcing them to pause before following. Bridget, follow on the left. Tad, you take the right and I'll stay center. We can't protect them from the rear, said Tad, puzzled. Tyrion started jogging, and his children did likewise. There are hundreds of Crytek here already. We can't protect anyone. If anything starts killing them, it will give us advance notice. We can counterattack if there are many, or change course if they run into something too big for us. But, Tad started to protest, 
Shut up and run, boy, ordered Tyrion. If you want to live, you'll do as I say. Tyrion was thinking as they ran. Lyra and Abby are at the house. Ashley, David, Sarah and Piper are at the four storage chambers. They should be safe, so long as the Sheha haven't discovered our plans. Emma and Ryan were a big question, though. He wasn't sure where they were. Emma had earned a rest after her efforts, and Ryan might or might not be with her. A black cloud, lit from within by red and orange flashes, rolled out from the left side of the street, engulfing the first four people running ahead of them. Tyrion didn't recognize the technique, but it was definitely a spell weave of some sort. Those who were touched by it died almost instantly. Focusing his mage sight, he identified three Crytek within the building. Run left! he yelled. The cloud was still moving, passing to their right, so moving left would make it easier for them to avoid it. It also sent them heading more directly toward their enemies. Tyrion sent a tightly focused blast of pure force toward the building, aiming not for the Crytek, but the supporting wall that faced the street. His second blast struck an interior wall, and the building shifted, collapsing inward and towards them. That wasn't likely to hurt the Crytek, since they were using powerful shields, but it was hard for anyone to do much while a building fell on them. The now smaller band of fugitives ran around the collapsed building, circling it to continue on a different street. He pointed at the shifting pile of rubble as they passed. Bridget. She grinned and nodded as she slowed her pace. A finely focused beam of power lanced out from the rubble, aimed directly at her midsection, but the chain hovering in the air around her moved to deflect it. Seconds later, the collapsed building exploded in two places, as its entombed occupants used their energies to blast their way free. The first of the Crytek to emerge fell in three pieces as her chain lashed forward, slicing through it. The second dug back, retreating into the pocket within the rubble that it had occupied. Another cloud of roiling black and red emerged instead. A cloud of violent energies moved far faster than any normal cloud would have, perhaps as fast as a deer might run. Bridget wouldn't be able to escape it on foot, and she could already tell it would eat straight through any normal shield she placed in front of it. Whether it could get through the rune shield around her body was another question, but she didn't intend to test it. Her chain sped forward, stretching out like some impossibly long arrow as it went through the cloud. It had no effect on the spell weave, but after it went through it, it went into the hole in the rubble, seeking the Crytek and blurring into a whirlwind of sharp edges. It died almost instantly. But the cloud didn't vanish. Bending her knees, Bridget focused her power in her legs. Then she straightened, releasing the tension in her body like a whip, and she shot skyward. Tyrion watched, even as they continued herding their small group of refugees. Bridget's leap surprised him. Using Aethar to empower the body wasn't that unusual, but his daughter had shifted her power almost instantly, and done so with perfect efficiency. Her leap took her almost a hundred feet into the air. He wondered how she intended to handle the landing. She soared up, making a parabolic arc as she flew, but her chain never stopped moving. It found the third Crytek as she reached the apex. The creature was already dead as she began her meteoric fall, black hair streaming behind her like the tail of a comet. She sailed over the fallen building and made no attempt to slow her descent. Instead, she landed hard, the empowered muscles in her legs and back absorbing the impact. Tyrion also spotted the telltale flash of Aethar inside her body, as the enchantment she had crafted into her bones was forced into activity for a second. Bridget had planned her leap, for she landed some fifty feet ahead of her father and the band of refugees. Straightening, she turned her head to look back at them, tossing the black mane of her hair over one shoulder and grinning ecstatically at Tyrion and Tad. She didn't wait, though. Like a wild animal, she darted off, running before them. She ran faster than any of those following, and soon she was lost to sight. Tad angled his run to bring him closer as he shouted, She's crazy! Tyrion nodded. I could never recall seeing Bridget looking so happy before. The last ten minutes of their jog was uneventful. The only Crytek they encountered on the way were dead and dismembered. Bridget's chain had been busy. They found her crouched down a couple of hundred yards from the wall that surrounded the house and dormitory where they lived, the true Albemarle as Tyrion's children thought of it. The wall had fallen in most places. Only jagged remnants remained, jutting upward at irregular intervals. Hundreds of Crytek fought in the area around it, seemingly with one another. Smoke was rising from the dormitory building. Ian and Violet were with Bridget, though Ian was unconscious and one arm looked to be broken. What happened to him? asked Tyrion. Probably fell in a hole trying to hide, he thought uncharitably. We were attacked before we got here, explained Violet. He killed one and then nearly got himself squashed trying to keep a wall from falling on me. 
Tyrion's brows went up in surprise, and he glanced at Bridget. She merely shrugged. I took out the last two and levitated his body, finished Violet. She could see the doubt in their faces. I know, I know, I never expected he had it in him either. Bridget had already turned her attention back to the battle raging some distance ahead of them. Some of the Crytek are Protheans, she announced. They keep vanishing and reappearing. Thilmarius must have taken me seriously, observed Tyrion. How do we get through that? asked Tad. A good question, thought Tyrion. He looked at Violet. Take my hand. Then he spoke to Bridget and Tad. If they notice us before I finish, try to buy us some time. Violet reached out hesitantly. Link with me, commanded Tyrion, grasping her hand firmly. His daughter's mind shied away from his instinctively for a moment, but then she forced herself to relax, and her thoughts began to mingle. He wasted no time. His mind expanded, and his body dwindled to insignificance as his self grew to encompass the air around them. Albemarle shrank beneath them as he joined the clouds, filling them with his anger. The sky darkened, and the wind picked up dramatically. Tad and Violet watched as the weather changed from mild to frightening in the span of a few minutes. Even the warring Crytek noticed, and some of the enemy peeled away from the battle, heading toward the small group of humans. Bridget tensed, preparing to meet them, but Tad put a hand on her shoulder. Don't let them come to us. Whatever he's doing is going to be bad. You don't want to be out there when it happens, Tad cautioned. Let's try this instead. Holding up one hand, he bent his will and his strength forward, tearing at the ground between them and the enemy, pulling it up to create a makeshift barrier. It wouldn't be enough to stop them, but it slowed their advance. Seeing what he was doing, Bridget began to help, using her greater strength to good effect. And then the sky exploded. The light was so brilliant it blinded them, as lightning began to fall in sheets so dense it seemed like some bizarre actinic rain. The thundering roar that accompanied it was deafening. The lightning seemed to devour everything in the space between their group and the ruined wall of Albemarle. Some of the Crytek survived. Those with strong spell-woven shields were merely stunned, but most of the battling Shi'ha had already been wounded. Those without perfect defenses were slain instantly, and smoke began to rise from their charred corpses. The shower of lightning continued for a full minute before it finally stopped. They looked at Tyrion. His eyes were fluttering, but he still hadn't regained himself. Violet gave the command. He's done. Run for it. Using her rathar, she lifted Tyrion and Ian both and began the charge. Bridget, Tad, and the seven frightened people from Lincoln who were still with them took the hint and followed her lead. Bridget and Tad overtook Violet and got ahead, ranging to either side to kill any Crytek that was still moving. Most weren't, though. They passed through the former battleground with almost no resistance, and a few minutes later they reached the wall. Climbing awkwardly over the rubble of a fallen section, they were inside. Chapter 44 The first thing Tyrion noticed was an oddly ephemeral spell weave that hung over the entire interior region behind where the walls had been. It wasn't sure of its purpose, for it didn't block Aethar or material things from passing through it. He hesitated at its border, along with his children, but the mundane citizens of Lincoln who were still with them ran blindly through, since apparently it was only visible to mage sight. They were unharmed and Tyrion could see Ryan standing at the door of his home, motioning for them to enter. Taking a deep breath, he stepped through, feeling an odd chill pass down his spine as his body went through the alien magic. But he wasn't hurt. Following his example, the others crossed over as well, and then they ran for the house. Since the fighting on that side of Albemarle had effectively ceased due to a lack of combatants, things were quiet at the moment. Ryan met them at the door. We weren't sure you had survived, said Ryan. Tyrion nodded. It appears the worst of the attack came here. Are the others all right? Where is Lyra? Inside, responded Ryan, with Emma, Abby, and Thilmarius. Thilmarius? He saved them. None of us would have survived the first minute if he hadn't been waiting, explained Ryan. Is he responsible for this strange shield around everything? It prevents them from teleporting into the area, explained Ryan. And yes, he did that. Otherwise there would have been no way to organize a defense. Tyrion and the others went inside, while Ryan remained at the door, guarding against the almost inevitable next assault. As soon as Tyrion passed the threshold, his senses found Lyra. She was in the dining room with everyone else. Being the largest room, it was the most obvious location for them to gather. He went to her immediately. She was holding Kate's baby, her baby now, but her eyes had a wild look in them. 
Her expression gained some relief when she saw him. Everything has come undone, my love. I glanced from her to the others. Everyone was watching him. What do you mean? Your enemies moved too soon. Even with the Prathian's assistance, we won't last long. Emma's eyes were on him, her expression unreadable. Tyrion knew what she must be thinking. Bridget still looked energized by her recent combat, but the rest looked deeply worried. Nothing had worked out exactly as he planned it, but somehow he felt more comfortable with the chaos and uncertainty than he had during the peace and planning of the past few years. I felt sure it was a sign of the madness bubbling even now at the back of his brain. Tossing back his head, he began to laugh. His plan might be disordered, but it hardly mattered. None of it would change the end result. His laughter did nothing to reassure the other people in the room. Some of them were already close to panic, so Tyrion did his best to suppress the paradoxical giggles that were bubbling up from the dark center of his being. Forcing a serious expression, he turned to Emma. Where is Brengor? Her eyes flicked toward Dilmerius for a second before she answered. In the usual place, until he is needed again. Tyrion nodded. That meant he was in stasis in the chamber nearest to Albemarle where Tyrion's experiments had taken place. Then he addressed Dilmerius. How much longer do you think your people can keep them out of here? The Law Warden's expression was dark. Not much longer. Your arrival took out almost half of those attacking here, as well as half of the Crytek that were defending. More of your enemies are arriving with each passing minute. Thank you, Thilmarius, said Tyrion. I doubted you before, but I believe you now. You've done enough. Return home before you become another casualty. What will you do? asked the Prathian, concerned. I have a way to hide us, don't worry. Have your Crytek protect this place for a few minutes more, then they can withdraw. Very well, agreed Thilmarius sadly. I will go and pass the word to them. He vanished, becoming invisible. The only further sign of him was the door opening and closing as he left the room. Tyrion waited until he heard the front door open and close as well before he continued. Emma, take everyone to Brangor. Ian, Bridget, Violet, Tad, Abby, you will be taken to your assigned places. Tell the others, Ashley, David, Sarah, and Piper when you arrive, then tuck yourselves in for a long sleep. When you next awaken, the world will be a different place. After they're settled, Emma, you and Ryan will go to the next site and continue your work. Once you finish, go to your place and do the same. Make sure to deal with Brangor first, though. He's the only one who knows the locations of all the chambers. Emma nodded. Yes, father. Bridget stepped forward. No. Tyrion focused on her. Pardon me. Her shoulders were square and her back straight. I'm not going. I have no interest in a new world. Everything I want is here. You'll die, he told her. Is that what you want? I don't care, she admitted. I want to be free and unfettered. If this is the end, it's my last chance. Fine, you'll stay with me. But be warned, I have no intention of dying. When I'm done, I'll put you in a box or tie you into a not trying. Bridget smiled. I'd love to see you try. Tyrion looked back at Lyra. You and Layla will stay with me as well. You couldn't have sent me away without you anyway, answered Loreliantha. Emma led the others to Tyrion's bedroom, and relaxing her mind slightly, she spoke to the earth, opening the way down into the tunnel that led to Tyrion's experimental chamber. As they went down the steps, he gave her one further command. Close the way, but don't hide it. By the time they find it, you'll be gone, but I need them to find something to prevent them from tearing the entire foundation up hunting us. She nodded and soon after the stone closed once more over the opening, but this time the tunnel beneath remained visible to mage sight. Tyrion went back to the dining hall, and on impulse he hugged Lyra and then stroked Layla's soft cheek. He glanced at Bridget, unsure if she would welcome an embrace or not, but she took the initiative. Stepping forward, she put her arms around him, squeezing tightly for a brief moment. You remember what I told you when you were dying? Yeah. I still mean it. After that, he led them to the front entry. It had one door leading outside, and doors on either side, and one at the end leading to different parts of the house. Motioning for them to stand near the front door, he spoke to the earth and opened the way to his last remaining secret. The floor shifted as the foundation began to flow, revealing a staircase that ended in a featureless stone wall. Once there, Tyrion put his hand on it, and the stone vanished, revealing another chamber beneath the house. It was a circular chamber, twenty feet in diameter. 
At its center were three adult-sized stone sarcophagi and four smaller ones. He had intended them originally for Kate, Lyra, and himself, with the smaller ones for Inara, Eldin, Layla, and Garlin. His chest clenched briefly at the thought. Now Bridget would have to use Kate's, while most of those for the children would remain empty, save for Layla's. Together, he and Lyra put Layla gently into her stasis box, kissing her once more before he activated the enchantment. The infant's face became motionless as the magic took hold and time stopped for her. Then he closed the lid over her. What if we never awaken? mused Lyra sadly. I'll make certain that doesn't happen, he told her. I'll have Abby take the first watch once I'm done, and even if something happens to her, my box will have a finite time set. If it runs out, I'll wake up automatically. Is this really necessary to save my people? she asked him, her blue eyes dark in the dim light. Tyrion shook his head. I'm not going to save your people. Her aura flashed angrily in his mage sight. Not the Illenials, Tyrion. Layla, Bridget, you and the rest of your children. You are my people now. You are my family. Oh, well yes then, he told her. This is the only way I can save your people. Rest here, and I will return to release you once it is safe again. I give you my word. I will return for you. He had never meant anything more in his life. She lay down in the stone sarcophagus, and he activated the enchantment, finishing it by speaking the phrase that would be the key to releasing it one day. He had been thinking of Kate when he thought it up, but it applied equally well to Lyra. Your husband waits for your return. That should have been it, but on impulse he added something else. And your forgiveness. When he had finished, he could feel Bridget's eyes on him. Are you ready? he asked her. You aren't putting me in one of those? She answered flatly. Are you getting in one? Not yet, he replied. I need to give Emma an hour or two to finish her work before I unleash the Crytek. Then I will wait with you, said Bridget firmly. And if I don't get enough blood before you're ready, I won't be getting into any boxes. Not alive, anyway. He nodded. Let's go upstairs, then. You can guard the house until it's time. Together they walked up the steps. Bridget felt an errant breeze on her cheek as they went, almost as if someone had passed. She turned her head and focused her senses, but no one was there. You should close this entry. Tyrion disagreed. Not until I'm ready. I'll close it when you go in to stay, or if they manage to fight their way past you. Her visage was calm. You'll be waiting a long time, then. Bridget, I'm serious. I don't intend to leave you to die here. Don't you want to see the new world? You could have a new life, take a husband, have children of your own. She began to laugh. I will never have a man to bed, not unless he has the strength to command my respect, or failing that, the power to bend me to his desire. Do you know of such a man? Reconsidering his words, he had to admit the thought seemed rather ridiculous, but he remembered the change that had occurred when she had been forced to care for Inara and Eldin. And he still found it sad. After all he had wrought, all the evils he had done and still had to do, to think that Bridget would never have a chance at something better. Glancing up, he saw she was still staring at him, a challenge in her eyes as she waited for his reply. With a sigh, he answered, No, I don't. She stepped up to him. There is only one whom I respect, and I won't have him. There is only one strong enough to force me, and he would never do such a thing. Standing on her toes, she kissed his cheek before turning away. Emma leaned over Brangle's stasis box as he opened his eyes. We have another task for you. The Morden mage sat up, counting the people around him. They seemed even more tense than usual, which was saying something. Where do you want to go? Several places, she answered promptly. First, I want you to take Violet to Chamber 1, then return and take Abby and Ian to Chamber 2. After that, Tad needs to go to Chamber 3, and then you'll take Ryan and me to the next target. I knew better than to ask questions. I did as he was told taking Violet first and leaving as she started talking to her sister Ashley, who was already at Chamber One. He did the same with the others, until only Emma and Ryan were left. As he put his hands out for them, Emma spoke again. Actually, take us to Chamber Four before we go to the target. I need to talk to Piper. Just in case we don't make it back, she needs to know it's time to find her rest. Abby stood on the opposite side of Brangor as he teleported her and Ian, and after they arrived, she was glad to see David. The thought of being alone with her demented brother was unpleasant. No more citizens to put away, asked David. She shook her head. 
The Senti have attacked. Those left are lost. Father wants us to find our boxes and get in them. Hard to believe we're really doing this, said David. What will it be like when we open our eyes again, I wonder? For me, not much different, said Abby. The enchantment on her stasis box was set with a timer included. She would waken after a year to make certain everything was as it should be. She would continue to rise periodically after that, checking on the state of the world. Someone had to decide when it was safe for what was left of humanity to emerge. If you prefer, I could take your place, Abby, suggested Ian, with a wicked gleam in his eye. She could only imagine what he might do, alone in a cavern full of helpless women. That won't be necessary. Ian laughed. Still don't trust me. I'm your brother, after all. Let's find our places, said David, tired of the conversation already. How about a hug before we part, said Ian, mockingly. He didn't really expect either of them to accept his offer. Abby glanced at David, meeting his eyes, and he nodded faintly back at her. Then she answered, One hug, but make it brief. Ian looked at her, confused, and then he smiled. Opening his arms, he embraced her, though she kept her own hands at her side. There won't be many of us in this new world, right, Abs? We have to stick together. He slid one hand down to caress her hip. And then he stiffened, his body jerking as though it had been struck by lightning, as David's knife slid between the vertebra in the middle of his back. His arms lost their strength, and Abby pulled them away before helping him down to the floor. Ian's eyes stared up at her while his mouth gaped. He was still conscious, but he couldn't draw breath to speak. You won't be there said David, looking down, and the world will be better for it. Abby's expression was hard. Before you die, you should know this wasn't just our decision. We all agreed to it. Even Emma couldn't forget what your part in all this was, and no one wanted to see you trying to act as a father to all those children. They'll be better off this way. Ian died, and when Abby stood back up, her hands were trembling. David looked at her with concern. Abby was the least suited for this sort of thing. She still had more compassion than any of them. I'm sorry, Abby, but you know it was for the best. I started to embrace her, but she stepped back. No more hugs, David. Not now, not after that, she told him. She wasn't sure she would ever be able to hug another person again, not without remembering. I'm sorry, he replied, looking down. It isn't fair that this has fallen on you. You're the last person who should have to do this. Stretching out his hand, he offered her the dagger. It was a short, ugly thing, a dark iron blade with no magic or enchantment on it at all. They had chosen it because it was the least likely weapon to be noticed by a mage. It would be useless against a shield of any type, strong or weak, enchanted or otherwise. It would only serve against a defenseless target, one who trusted the holder. Whatever his sins had been, Ian had trusted David and Abby. Abby accepted it, tucking it into the belt around her waist. It has to be me. I couldn't forgive myself otherwise. Nor can I forgive myself for the horrors I've already committed, she added mentally. David nodded, and then the two of them found their respective boxes and got inside. Activating the enchantment from within, they were frozen in time, and then they knew no more. Chapter 45 The place where Emma and Ryan appeared was bitterly cold. Located near the southern pole, she wondered if it was even worth the effort, but Tyrion had been adamant. According to him, the locations were irrelevant. It was the effect they would have on the weather afterward that was important. A darker, colder world would be difficult for any she who survived the plague, if any survived. Emma settled in, making herself comfortable before beginning her task, and Ryan held her hand, raising a shield around the three of them and beginning his vigil. Brangor simply waited. Each time he had taken them to one of their targets, the result had been frightening. Twice he had feared they wouldn't survive. He doubted today would be any different, especially without the wild girl here to reinforce the shield. Soon, the earth began to shake. Not in a steady fashion, but with great hiccuping jerks followed by still pauses. A deep cracking sound issued from the distant horizon, and the sky in that direction grew dark. A hot wind blew from that direction and Ryan reinforced the shield surrounding them, keeping whatever toxic fumes were in the air from reaching them. Bowing his head, he seemed to be meditating, and then, after a moment, Emma's eyes began to flutter. 
It's time to go, he told Brangor. Their next destination should have been a quiet one. It had been when they had scouted it months before. It lay dozens of miles from the border of the Galen Grove. Today, though, the area was swarming with Shiha. They roamed the region, no more than a few hundred yards between one and the next. Ryan's mage site identified them by their odd shapes. Crytek. They didn't have a Prathian with them to hide their presence this time, and apparently the Shiha had enough knowledge of geology to figure out where they would likely show up. The Crytek noticed their appearance just as quickly as Ryan identified them. All those within range began to circle in toward them, signaling those farther away to join them. Take us back, ordered Ryan. No, said Emma. We will finish this. They'll kill us, Em. There are too many, he argued. Give me just a few minutes, then they'll be too busy dying to worry about us. The determination in her face wouldn't be denied. It was still holding her, since she had hardly had time to recover her senses after her last effort. Emma reached up with one hand and pulled his mask away. Let me see you one more time. We don't have time for this, he protested, flinching as his face became visible. He knew how hideous he was. Craning her neck, Emma kissed his scarred cheek. He no longer had lips to serve the purpose. I know you think you're ugly, but you've always been beautiful to me, she said. You're a fool, Em. With a thought, he activated the runes on his arm, creating a powerful rune shield around them. Then he noticed that Brangor was gone. The Morden Mage had decided to take his chances with the kill tattoo rather than face a horde of Crytek. We're going to die. You know that. Them first, she whispered and then she relaxed, closing her eyes. The first attacks hardly registered. The shield created by the enchantment on his arm was reinforced by the power he had stored in it. But the Crytek around them grew in number with each passing minute, and the spell weaves that they used to tear at his defense grew more powerful as the Crytek realized their enemy wasn't fighting back. They took their time, creating efficient weaves to cut into his magic. Minutes passed as they strove to destroy the shield and with each second the attacks grew stronger and the Aethar stored in his arm dwindled. Ryan ignored them, focused wholeheartedly on his task and keeping his attention on Emma's peaceful face. She could almost be asleep, he thought. He felt it when the energy in his arm faded. The shield flickered, but he threw his own power into it, straining with all his might to keep it intact. The effort required was enormous, but he would not relent. Watching Emma... Tears began to run from his one good eye. I love you, Em. I've always loved you. She couldn't hear him, of course. Her mind was far away. And then the strain overcame him. The shield collapsed, and he sank into unconsciousness. It was a small mercy that he never felt the pain of the blast that severed his head from his shoulders. Emma struggled in the darkness of the earth. Above, she could see the tiny speck of flesh that had been her body, still cradled in the arms of the man she loved. It was hard to let go, to expand enough to accomplish her task. The rock was more stable here. It needed more convincing to release its bonds. Yet her attention kept returning to the two human forms crouched on the surface. Time was her enemy, and the distraction made it worse. Whatever time was. She was nearly there when she felt the man's death. The pain of it made her contract, losing her grip on what she'd been doing. Ryan. The name meant something to her, and with it came a torrent of emotion and pain. Anger filled her, and at last she was able to release her hold on the flesh that tormented her. She expanded, leaving her pain behind and carrying the rage as her humanity faded. The ground where Emma and Ryan's bodies lay exploded upward as thousands of tons of rock and soil erupted. It swelled for a moment and then coalesced, forming a massive giant of stone with eyes of red fire. The Crytek attacked immediately. They were not created to know fear, but their attacks did little to the monster in their midst. The giant swept those nearest away, using her colossal stone fists, and then she gestured at the earth. Red-hot magma shot forth in geysers around her. The earth shook as she sundered the foundations of the world with her will, with her anger. The land shook for hundreds of miles in every direction, and the thing that had been Emma strode across it, killing every living thing that she found. Humanoids, animals, and trees she destroyed, but she hated the trees most of all. Her wrath lasted for days, but none survived to tell of it. When it finally ended, she lay down and found her rest, 
surrendering her body of stone and rejoining the earth. I wonder why they haven't attacked, said Tyrion. Bridget was pacing, frustrated. You did too much when you came in. They probably think you'll call the lightning down again. Tyrion grunted. Maybe. The Crytek are made to be cautious, but perhaps they don't want to lose the rest of their force. The ground bucked beneath their feet, and then a distant roar rolled over them. What's that Emma's doing? asked Bridget. He shook his head. She's too far away. None of the targets were close enough for us to feel anything. It was one of the decoy chambers. Poking his head out of the doorway, he looked in the direction of the city. A dark brown cloud rose above it. They must have been using their time to search for the rest of the people we hid. There were several such chambers in the city. Hidden, but not hidden. They were meant to be found. Each had several hundred of the slave mages entombed in the stasis boxes they had created for themselves. The enchantments were traps, though. They held more Aethar than necessary, and when tampered with, they were made to deconstruct themselves with violent consequences. Tyrion gave an evil chuckle. Once the enemy had tangled with a few of those, they would be more hesitant to look for the rest of the people he had sequestered. The chambers that held the citizens of Colne and Lincoln were located much farther away and much deeper in the earth. They were hidden using his and Emma's special talent. While he was almost certain the Shihar couldn't find them, he had decided that the best way to stop the enemy from looking was to give them something to find. Making the decor chambers into traps was just an added benefit. Bridget went to the door. It's been more than an hour, closer to two. I'm tired of waiting. He sighed. I can't release the Crytek until you go downstairs and get into that box. I'm going to take my reward. Tyrion frowned. What you promised me years ago, father. Blood. They'll just overwhelm you. You can't win, Bridget. I don't want to win, she replied. That's your job, but I cannot lose. She gave him a feral grin, the light of madness shining clearly in her eyes. You lose when they kill you. Bridget pulled the dirty dress she wore over her head. That was the one she had taken to wearing while she cared for Inara and Eldin. They can't kill me, father. Only I can do that. Come, watch me. Watch me bleed and burn. Tyrion's heart twisted suddenly. He had thought he was done with such emotions, but now that he knew what she meant to do, he found himself reluctant. I don't want to lose her. I've lost too many already. Don't do this, please. She ignored him, walking out the door. Damn it, he swore. Running down the stairs, he removed the two tokens he needed from the chamber below. I didn't want to survive this anyway. He noticed something odd before he left the chamber. A spell wave had been laid over the stasis box. What? he said, talking to himself in the dark. Examining the alien magic, he read the pattern. Since taking the Loshti, he had gotten much better at identifying their magics, just as he could now speak and read their language perfectly. The spell weave was a lock, and a trap. It would have to be removed before the enchantment on her sarcophagus could be released, and if it were forced, the results would be lethal. And he didn't know the key. He stared at it, thinking hard. Only one person could be responsible. Thilmarius hadn't left when he said he would. He had waited and listened. He discovered our betrayal, thought Tyrion, and then committed one of his own. Now he had an excellent reason to leave. Listening to the stone for a moment, he closed the chamber and ran back up the stairs. Bridget was already outside, walking away from the house. He caught up to her. Let's head for the Prathian Grove. As long as there's fighting, she answered. What do you want to do there? I need to find Dilmarius. Chapter 46 Bridget got her wish almost immediately. Once they had left the area closest to Albemarle and begun walking toward the grove, the Crytek took notice of them. It started with several massive spell beasts running at them. Tyrion used the tattoos on his right arm as a channel, directing a precise lance of power that tore through the heart of each beast. Spell beasts were largely immune to most attacks. Their bodies would simply reform after any injury. But he had faced enough of them during his years in the arena that he had learned to spot the central nexus of the magic that sustained them. Bridget gave him a harsh look. Don't worry, there'll be more, he said reassuringly. And there were. He and his daughter broke into a fast trot, covering ground and trying to keep their momentum going as a nightmarish assembly of bizarre Crytek began appearing from different directions. 
Tyrion's rune-channeled blasts were sufficient to pierce their defenses and slay them at great distances until there were just too many to continue. His focused attacks took too long and required precision to aim. Emma wouldn't have had that problem, he thought with a smile, thinking of her with pride before they fell on him. He kept his arm blade short and intense, ensuring that even glancing strikes would still have the power required to break the defenses of his foes, and he never, ever stopped moving. They were everywhere, and the close range meant that any attack that landed might have the necessary force to bring his journey to the Prathian Grove to an abrupt and fatal end. Tyrion ducked and dodged, keeping his defense tight and strong, so that it shed the few blows that landed. He cut and he slew, but the number of times an unseen strike sent him reeling told him that part of his success was down to luck. If any of the attacks that found him had been strong enough, it would have been over. Bridget was another matter entirely. She moved across the field as though it was what she had been born to do, dancing through her foes with a grace that was beautiful despite its grisly results. Though she was nearly as strong as her father, she wasted none of her power on defense, as if she believed that Athar spent to preserve her life rather than ending another's was a waste. The distance between them gradually grew greater as they fought. Neither of them was particularly adept at fighting as a team, but for Bridget it hardly mattered. She was a goddess of destruction and she had no need of allies. Her chain was everywhere, soaring and flying away at one moment and then dipping back down to deflect attacks that she couldn't manage to dodge but it wasn't her only weapon. Bridget's arms were sheathed in power, and she used them flawlessly, as though it cost her nothing in attention to control the chain that wove around her. Inevitably, however, there were too many even for her to avoid or deflect all the attacks. A spell-woven tentacle slipped past her chain and ripped through the meaty part of her right thigh, opening the flesh to the bone before she destroyed it. She would not be running any farther. Fifty yards away, Tyrion saw her stall and then stop, hobbling on her one good leg as she killed everything near her. Not being able to move was a fatal flaw, though. Her opponents no longer needed to avoid her advance, they only needed to stay out of the lethal zone around her. A circle began to form, and Tyrion knew they would pick her apart with long-range attacks. Altering course, he ran toward her, nearly getting himself killed with foolish haste. Bridget was laughing as the blood coursed down her leg. He was still twenty feet away when he sensed the change. The Crytek had paused, coordinating themselves for a joint assault that she'd be unable to block. Without thinking, he relaxed his mind, and in an instant he reached out to the earth. A wall of stone and earth ten feet thick shot up around the two of them, reaching thirty feet into the air. It also encompassed five or six Crytek unfortunate enough to have been caught within it. Bridget killed those in a heartbeat, before giving her father a disappointed look. What are you doing? Don't ruin this for me. You are about to get killed, he said, rebuking her. You can't go any further with your leg like that. She started laughing again, tipping her head back and letting the coarse laughter rise toward the heavens. She's utterly mad, he thought. But then she spoke a word, and an ugly red light began to flow from where the bone in her right leg was exposed. It wasn't just that bone, however. It was all of them. That one was simply the only one that was visible to normal sight. With his mage sight, Tyrion could see the runes covering the rest of her frame flaring to life, burning with the Aethar that she had carefully stored within them for so long. Bridget straightened, putting her weight once more on her damaged leg. You don't understand, father. They can't kill me. Every bone in her body was enchanted in a fashion very similar to that of her magical chain, allowing her to control them with her will alone. She had gotten the idea years before when she alone of all his children noticed that Tyrion had enchanted the bones in one of his legs to enable him to store an emergency reserve of power, but she had taken it several steps farther. Her entire body was a tool, one that she had used to store her power, and one that she would now use as a weapon to enact her bloody will on her enemies. And using it will kill her, Tyrion realized. Bridget, stop. We have alternatives. You don't need to do this. Open your barrier, father, so I don't have to waste this power tearing my way free, she replied, walking forward once more. He knew there was no stopping her. Lowering his head sadly, Tyrion opened the wall of earth ahead of them. Bridget began to run, her mouth open again as she laughed madly. Watch me, father! Watch me bleed! Watch me burn! The enemy were waiting when she emerged, and multiple lines of focused power converged on her as she ran out. She didn't bother trying to block any of them. They tore through her torso, arms and legs, shredding and tearing through her flesh. If she felt pain, she gave no sign. 
The chain flashed through the air and destroyed everything that moved within its reach, and Bridget kept running. The Crytek focused on her, almost ignoring the man who followed in her wake. Tyrion ran behind, killing those that approached from her rear. As she advanced, the Shi'ar continued their attacks, attacks Bridget no longer wasted time avoiding. She ran, and she slew, and with every minute that passed there was less undamaged flesh left on her. Her skeleton was showing in dozens of places, and fire seemed to flow from her wounds, limning her body in crimson flames. But Bridget would not die. They had passed the boundary of the Elenial Grove now, and they angled their path to take the shortest path through it to the Prothean Grove. There were fewer Crytek here, other than the few survivors that chased them. The Elenial children they crossed paths with offered no resistance, but Bridget killed them anyway. When they reached the Prothean Grove, the Shihar there tried to fight, but they were far worse at it than the battle-bred Crytek. She slaughtered any she found in her path, and when one of the elders roused itself enough to attack her with a massive bolt of Viridian power, she simply laughed. The Prothean elders' blast scoured most of the remaining flesh from her burning bones, but she still did not die. Making note of which tree had attacked, Bridget altered her course to return the favor. A powerful spell-woven shield appeared around the trunk, but she tore through it, using the burning bones in her hands as though they were claws. And then she placed one bony palm against it and sent out a pulse that shattered the massive trunk. Bridget was running again before the tree had even begun to fall. Tyrion followed and all he could do was watch as she spent her life in front of him. In truth, he knew she was already dead. Her heart and most of her vital organs had been destroyed almost as soon as she left his protection. What ran in front of him now was what was left, a blazing symbol of hatred and vengeance infused with Bridget's mind and will. Two more of the Prathian elders tried to stop her, with similar results. After that, if any of them were awake, they did nothing to provoke her. The children of the elders, the Prathian Shiha, began to appear in greater numbers. They fought with illusions and ambushes, appearing suddenly and vanishing if they survived her violent reprisals, but they couldn't stop her. Eventually they gave up. Though they didn't value their lives nearly as much as a human might, there was no point in letting her kill them. The Prathians vanished and remained hidden. Bridget continued her run, heading for Elantrea and now that she had been deprived of prey, she began to kill every Prathian elder that had the misfortune to find itself in her path. But with each trunk shattered, with every use of that devastating power, Bridget's flames dimmed. Eventually, her steps faltered, and soon after that, she fell. Tyrion stopped, kneeling beside her, his heart aching. He had no tears left. He had used them all up after losing Kate and his little ones but he still felt a black despair as he watched her fading in front of him. Bridget looked up at him, her burning skull almost completely bare, with only a small bit of scalp and hair still attached. There were flames where her eyes had been, but they were flickering like candles in a strong wind. Without her throat or lungs she couldn't speak, but her thoughts reached him. Do you think they'll forgive me? Who? Inara and Eldin, for failing them. The lump in his throat almost made it impossible to answer. I'm sure they're waiting for you. I bet Haley has been playing with them to keep them occupied until you get there. He had grown up thinking the Shi'ar elders, the god trees, were divine. Now that he knew they were merely sentient trees, he had no idea what to believe, or whether there was any sort of afterlife at all. But as he watched his daughter's fire going out, he could only believe there must be something for her after death. Haley. She whispered with her thoughts. I did this for her in the beginning. She told me to take care of you, father, but I couldn't even do that. She would have been proud of you, he muttered. I love... Bridget's thought was never finished. The flames guttered out and her bones collapsed into ash. All that was left of her now was dust. Tyrion sat there, staring at what remained watching as the breeze picked up her ashes and began to scatter them. It didn't have to be like this, he muttered. I could have saved you if only you'd let me. But that hadn't been what she wanted. Looking around, he gauged his distance from Elantrea. It was still at least half a mile away, and he had no guarantee that Thilmerius would be there, waiting to be found if he got there. He could feel the eyes of the hidden Prathians on him, watching. Soon they would decide it was safe to attack. Tyrion stood, 
straightening his back and feeling the soreness in his muscles. He was tired, so very tired. He still had the strength to fight, but he knew it wouldn't be enough. It had been a fool's run trying to reach Ellen Treya. It had served no purpose other than to give Bridget her last wish. Watch me, father. Watch me bleed. Watch me burn. He had, and now he was out of time. His final task had waited long enough. Emma had surely finished and found safety in her own stasis box by now. Reaching into the pouch at his waist, Tyrion pulled out the small iron talisman that served as the key to particular stasis boxes, the ones that held his final gift to the Shiha. With a word he activated it, and several hundred stasis enchantments stopped working, releasing the slave mages that Abby had prepared. The second item he removed from the pouch was one of the glass spheres that Ryan had created. They had all been identically made, with no master. If any of them was broken or released, all of them would be. Tyrion waited, counting silently. Give the Morden time to find their destinations first. The first attack nearly caught him unprepared. Ducking, Tyrion felt the spell-woven tendril pass over him. His return stroke was raw and unfocused, but it sent the Prathian who had appeared flying backward, stunned if unheard. Clenching his hands into fists, Tyrion gripped the air around him with his Aethar, whipping it into a wind so tight and swift that it screamed as it circled him. Within seconds, the tempest had become a deadly whirlwind that caught up leaves and dirt, sticks and small stones. It expanded around him, sweeping outward with deadly power, destroying everything it touched. Tyrion poured his power into it, but he ignored its results. It was merely a distraction. In the back of his mind, he continued counting. His strength was coming to its end when he finished his count. Five hundred, he intoned, letting the wind die down. Touching the glass sphere with one finger, he erased one rune and watched the magic that powered its tiny stasis field collapse. The glass cracked, and the small, wasp-like crytek emerged, crawling up his arm. It sat there for a moment, sniffing his skin, excited by the Aethar in him. But it recognized its parent. Losing interest, it flew away in a seemingly random direction. It went almost a hundred feet, before diving toward a section of empty earth, a place that had been scoured clean of leaves, plants, and debris. It vanished for a moment, and then reappeared having eaten its way through the veil of invisibility that hid a Prathian who'd been sheltering there. The Shi'ar stared at it, puzzled, and then it dove, piercing the spell-woven shield around the Prathian and burrowing into his skin. Must not have been a law warden, thought Tyrion idly, otherwise he'd have known to kill it instead of staring at it. Not that it would have mattered. Hundreds of others just like it were finding their first meals in scattered locations around the world. If even half of them were killed by quick-thinking Shiha, it wouldn't matter. Only a few had to succeed to start a cascade that would eventually kill every human, Shiha child and elder who lived under the sun. Tyrion watched the Prathian die, screaming. And then he smiled. Chapter 47 The calm left behind after Tyrion's windstorm died down was short-lived. Only moments after the Prathian finished dying, his enemies renewed their attacks. The Prathian Crytek had arrived, probably called back by the Elders, desperate to stop Bridget's one-woman rampage to their grove. She was dead already, but that merely simplified their job, which was now reduced to getting rid of him. The first appeared directly behind him, a monstrous beast that stood on four legs and was ten feet tall at the shoulder. Invisibility aside, it was hard to imagine how such a thing moved quietly enough to get that close, but it had. And its first spell weave was already prepared. A wide circle appeared in front of it, trapping Tyrion within its boundaries as it began to contract. Tyrion was tired. He had fought long and hard, even while following in Bridget's wake, and the windstorm he had just used had drained him of what energy had been left. Adrenaline didn't help him either. A man can only fight for so long, facing death at every turn, before he finds himself numb. Tyrion's heart didn't even quicken as this latest threat materialized. In the quiet void that was his heart and mind, Tyrion wondered, This must be it. I'll finally be able to rest. But his actions didn't reflect that silent sentiment. Too many years of struggling to survive had been ingrained in his soul to accept death so easily. 
Activating the enchantment on the bones of his leg, he drew deeply on the power stored there and used it to leap high into the air. His enchantment was nothing so serious as Bridget's. It merely kept a reserve of power for him to draw upon. It didn't make his bones unbreakable or anything as nuanced as turning him into an unkillable machine. As he sailed upward, he used that power to recreate his rune shield, and then he turned his attention on the ground below. Four more Crytek had appeared, and predictably they were preparing to destroy him in midair. That was always the danger of leaping high. You couldn't alter your course again until your feet found solid ground again. Taking the best aim he could manage while soaring skyward, he sent a rune channel blast down his arm and slew one of them. The rest of his power he devoted to his defenses. It almost wasn't enough. Their return fire knocked him sideways and sent him rocketing into the trunk of one of the presumably dormant Prathian elders. Stunned, he fell, and after a brief drop of ten feet, the ground knocked the rest of the wind out of him. Dazed, he sat up. Hardly able to think straight, he was still struggling to live. Old habits die hard. Somehow his shield was still up, but if the Crytek had followed up on their advantage then, he would have been finished. Oddly, though, they didn't fire, preferring to charge toward him. If he had been thinking clearly, he might have realized they didn't dare to damage the elder he was sitting in front of. The massive four-legged one reached him first, stomping down on him with a foot that he could now see was studded with large claws. Still sitting, he managed to lop it off with a drunken swing and then the damned creature fell on him, crushing him beneath its multi-ton body. Tyrion's shield-encased body sank into the soft ground, until it pressed against one of the Elder's roots, trapping him there between the bulk of the thrashing Crytek and the unyielding wood. He couldn't have been more helpless. His arms couldn't move, his torso was trapped, and he could only imagine his legs sticking awkwardly out of the ground on one side of his gargantuan oppressor. What a stupid fucking way to die. His immobility and the awkwardness of the Crytek, still foundering as it worked to stand on its three good legs on top of him, did give him a brief pause to think. He remembered what he had once told Emma. We don't need power, we become the power we seek to wield. And it had been a good line, though he wasn't sure he was remembering it exactly as he'd said it at the time. Either way, he knew what he needed to do. Fighting his instincts, he let his mind slip free, expanding slightly and growing to encompass more of the world around him. The earth surged beneath his human body, pushing him upward. Simultaneously, he tried to make the Elder's roots rise, to use as a weapon, but they ignored him. Their voice was different, as was that of the Crytek. He hadn't noticed it before, but his ability was much more difficult to use with regard to the physical forms of other living creatures. So he focused on the earth, using it to create a swell of earth that separated him from his massive opponent before he raised it like a thick shield around himself. The other Crytek were close, but they never reached him. Before they could attack his flimsy defense, they found themselves sinking into the ground, mired by soil that had somehow come to life. The fight that followed was surreal. Maneuvering his weakened human body and the ground around it simultaneously, he staggered to and fro, slashing at his opponents when they were close enough and using the ground to unbalance them whenever their attacks became too coordinated for him to handle. That was like fighting in a boat except that it only shifted and rolled beneath his enemies. Tyrion's body only staggered because of its exceptional exhaustion and fatigue. He finished those four off, and then noticed the horde that had grown around him. Hundreds more had found his position, but they were no longer paying any heed to him. A cloud of insects was in the air, and the Prathians danced and jerked as they tried to avoid being bitten. Some were already down, thrashing on the ground as they died. Tyrion's gift had finally come to fruition. Gouts of fire went up, along with other subtler uses of power, but while they killed some of his diminutive Crytek, they couldn't kill them all. The Prathian Crytek died, the Sheha with them died, and as the wasp burrowed into the bark of the elders, they began to die too. The buzzing of tiny wings became a roar in his ears as the dark clouds of Tyrion's vengeance grew and filled the sky. Tyrion's mind collapsed inward until he was merely a man again, and he lay down, letting his tiredness have its way. Lying in the dry leaves and churned up soil, he watched the world die around him. Many of his tiny children flew over to him, intrigued by his Aethar, but once they had sampled it and recognized him, they flew away again. He watched the clouds pass, white against the tiny blue spot visible through the canopy. Occasionally his view was obscured by the buzzing hordes, but that only made him smile.
drifting, he finally closed his eyes and fell asleep. The Shihark had finished dying without him. Thilmarius sat in the small room that had served him for many years while he oversaw the training of Prathian slaves. He could still remember clearly the first day he had seen Tyrion enter the room. It was not because the day had been special to him. It was a byproduct of being a law warden. The Loshti granted perfect recall, along with the knowledge of all the generations it had passed through before. A loaf of bread sat on the table in front of him. He had never been sentimental. It wasn't a trait his people prized, but it held a world of meaning for him now. It embodied a failed dream, his attempt at rising above the wrongs done in the past, to find a way forward for both his people and those they had wronged. The bread was perfect, lovely and light in its texture. It would have tasted wonderful, but he would never eat it. No one would. They had thought it was just the scent here that were being foolish, ignoring the accord and letting their paranoia and xenophobia spoil the accord. But today, he had learned differently. Tyrion had never intended to honor it either. He had planned all along to destroy the Shi'ha. He had admitted as much with his own words, and the hidden chamber that held Lurulliantha had been proof that he had not been making empty threats. The Elanials were no better. They had refused to help guard the humans choosing instead to sit quietly in their grove, waiting for the destruction that they had engineered. It went without saying that they had some plan for survival, even if it came at great cost, but he doubted that their salvation extended to the Prathian grove. They were the ultimate betrayers, and Tyrion had been their tool, unwittingly at first, but willingly at the end. But how will they do it? He didn't know. The Prathians were not in a good position, no matter how he looked at it. Having put themselves at the forefront defending Tyrion and his people, they were now firmly in the sights of the Sentir and Morden Groves, and probably the Galen as well. Did the Elenials plan to use them as scapegoats? Filmaria shook his head. That didn't make sense. Whatever Tyrion was planning, even a civil war wouldn't be big enough to give him what he wanted, which was apparently the destruction of all the Shi'ha. They had left his door open, and when a small insect flew in, buzzing as it homed in on him, his eyes spotted it immediately. He knew exactly what it was. Throwing himself backward, he avoided its first zooming dive at its head. Panic almost robbed him of reason, but he managed to fry the tiny creature with a small burst of fire before it came back for a second try. With a thought, he closed the door just as two more flew in. He fried them just as quickly. For the moment, he was safe. But for how long? At last he understood Tyrion's plan, though how the man had accomplished it eluded him. Had the Elenials created these forbidden Crytek for him? If so, why? From the behavior of the wasps, it seemed obvious that their original inclinations had been restored, which made them as great a danger to the Elenials as it did to the other groves. Why would they do such a thing? A buzzing grew outside his door, and his mage sight showed him an ever greater collection of the creatures gathering there. They weren't content to wait. They were already burrowing into the wood of the building, which, after all, was made from the extrusions of one of the Elder's roots. Most of them were digging into the door, though, weakening it as they sought to get to him. His mind ran through a quick succession of defensive spell weaves, but none of them would be sufficient. From what he knew, the creatures would eat through any magical defense he created, and the more Aethar he used, the more they would be drawn to him. He could kill some of them, but eventually he would lose. A feeling of helplessness swept over him, followed soon after by anger. It wasn't right. It wasn't fair. I tried to fix it. But Tyrion hadn't cared. All the human wanted was revenge. Narrow, short-sighted revenge. Just like any other barrette. Just like an animal, he intoned softly. And now he's killed us all. He had never been given to strong emotion, but his anger grew ever stronger. For the first time in his life, Thilmarius felt his anger burn hot. For the first time, Thilmarius hated. And then he had an idea. He would die, that was certain, but that didn't necessarily have to be the end. The Key and Thara were constructed using Sentir spell beasts and a spell weave that made them effectively immortal. He couldn't create a spell beast, but he could do something similar, using his own mind as the substrate for the magic. Of course it was forbidden and for good reason, but who would be left to gainsay his choices? He could already feel the building he occupied dying, along with the elder that it was comprised of. The rest of the elders were almost certainly suffering the same fate, 
and if the Crytek Plague was here, he was certain that Tyrion had made sure to spread it everywhere else as well. I could already see holes appearing in the wooden door. Time was running out. Drawing on the memories of his ancestors and feeding Aethar to his spell mind, he quickly began knitting the necessary spell weave together. I felt a pain in his leg as the first wasp bit into his flesh, burrowing inward. I felt like a fiery ember tunneling through his body. Ignoring the pain, he continued working. When the weave was finished, he swirled it around himself, letting it sink in over his shoulders like a shawl. The magic passed through his skin and went deeper, bringing with it a cold darkness. The pain of the crytek in his leg faded, and then his heart shuddered. Everything went dark for a moment as oblivion overtook him. Thilmerius died, and his eyes closed. But seconds later, they opened again. Did I die? Am I still me? he wondered. He still felt like himself, but his rational mind said otherwise. He knew that the true Thilmarius had to be dead. He was a replica, frozen in time by the spell weave, tied forever to a body that would never live again. But he certainly felt real, and he definitely felt hatred. He remembered the Crytek that had burrowed into his leg, what had happened to it. Examining himself, he found the entry hole, but the tiny Crytek's body was dead. Using his Aethar, Thilmarius carefully worked it free, and then watched in amazement as his leg healed itself afterward. He hadn't known that would happen. He also didn't understand what had killed the Crytek. He hadn't been sure how it would react to his transformation. His first expectation had been that it would simply carry on eating him without being able to kill him, but that definitely wasn't the case. More of the little creatures were buzzing around him now, but they showed no interest in him. Reaching out, he caught one with his hand, and then watched with interest as it died in his hand. I felt a tiny surge of Aethar as the Crytek's life force was sucked out. Oh, he said simply. So that was how it worked. A slow smile spread across his face. Unable to die, no longer of interest to the weapon that Tyrion or the Elunials had created, he should have no difficulties now. He had only one goal, to kill the man who had undone a civilization that had lasted for millennia. Chapter 48 Tyrion woke to silence. Something had tickled his nose but his mage sight detected no one nearby. Opening his eyes, he saw snow falling. Reaching up, he wiped it away only to find a grey smear on his finger. Ash. Emma did a good job, he thought, for the ash to fall this far away. He sat up. The air was bitterly cold, which was one reason he had expected snow. Shivering, he took to his feet, staggering a little as he found his balance. If he hadn't woken when he did, he might never have woken at all. It was freezing. With an almost unconscious effort of will, he surrounded his body with a blanket of warm air. Having solved that problem, he stretched out his senses, letting his mage sight explore the world within its reach. He found nothing alive. Well, that wasn't entirely true. There were animals and small plants, even a few stunted trees that had somehow survived among the tall elders of the Shi-Ha. But beyond those things, he found nothing. No Shi-Ha, no shining towers of Aethar representing the elders, and no humans. The Prathian Grove was a graveyard filled with the husks of dead trees and fallen bodies. Well, that's a nice change, he said aloud, mostly just to hear the sound of his own voice. It was deafeningly quiet. He had no idea what to do next. Walking home was the obvious choice, so he did, but he had hardly taken two steps before he thought of the emptiness he would find there. The only people in the house were Lorilliantha and Layla, and he could talk to neither of them. He didn't dare. Awakening them now, before he was certain that the Crytek he had created were gone, would be a death sentence. I've been alone before, he told himself but never this alone. Even during his solitary confinement in Elantre, there had been Amara coming several times a day to bring him food. At the moment, he was quite literally the last man left to walk the face of the earth. He kept walking, filled simultaneously with lonely dread 
and a curious lightness. His burden was gone. His trials were over. He had succeeded, and now he had nothing left to do. An empty future stretched out before him. It was when he finally entered his home in Albemarle that he remembered the spell weave over Lorelianthus stasis box. He couldn't waken her. Not in three months when the Crytek were gone. Not in years when the world began to recover. Not ever. Not unless he discovered the key to disarming the spell weave that kept her trapped. Unable to stop himself, he opened the way to her chamber. He spent the rest of the evening simply staring at her and Layla. At least he could waken Layla eventually. But how could he raise the child with no mother? Thinking of Kate sent his thoughts into dark downward spirals that revolved around her and his lost children. He had gained exactly what he wanted and lost everything that he had ever had. Having second thoughts, Barat, said a familiar voice over his shoulder. His mage sight told him no one was there, but he knew the voice. Thelmarius. Tyrion didn't move. How did he survive? The spell weef, that was the clue. The Law Warden hadn't just locked Lyra away from him. He must have hidden in the chamber. Tyrion activated his defensive tattoos. Did I startle you, animal? asked the Law Warden. I guess all your talk of humans being a sentient species was just for show, eh, Thilmarius? growled Tyrion in a low voice. Don't even begin to think to judge me, traitor, spat the Shi'ar. Tyrion turned slowly around, facing the empty space in which he knew Thilmarius must be standing. Oh, but I do. You call me a traitor. You blame me for the death of your people. You started all of this when you tortured me in the name of training, when you forced my children to fight one another, when your people took a world that wasn't theirs and nearly wiped humanity from it. My only mistake was in thinking we could bridge the gap between our people. I acted in good faith, trying to forge a better future for your kind. His voice was moving as he circled, trying to keep Tyrion from knowing exactly where he was. You were a fool, taunted Tyrion. The Law Warden appeared then, spell weavings flying from his hands to encircle Tyrion. He was standing five feet to his right. Tyrion leapt toward him, and before the magic could close around him, he thrust his right arm blade completely through the Shihar's chest, which accomplished exactly nothing. The Prothean never flinched, and his face showed no sign of pain. Tyrion might as well have been stabbing a straw dummy. Now that the veil of invisibility was gone, he could see something else as well. Thilmarius looked normal enough to his physical sight, but to his mage sight the man was a black void, an emptiness where a living body should have been. Something was wrong. Some kind of weird illusion. The spell weave around him had tightened now, like a strange thorny vine, and its power tore at his shield. He kept it at bay by continuing to put more energy into his defensive tattoos, but he couldn't keep it up forever. Shifting some of his power to his now trapped arms, he strengthened them until he could force them down and out, slicing through the magic that held him. Then he ran. The chamber that housed Lyra and Layla was no place for fighting. Thelmarius followed him, laughing softly. Do you think you can win, Barat? You only delay your defeat and make it more enjoyable for me. Up the stairs and through the front door, Tyrion ran into the yard. There was space there. When Thilmarius stepped through, he sent a blast of raw Aethar in the form of fire to engulf his body. The Law Warden had been overconfident and hadn't bothered to create a defensive spell wave, and he would pay for it. But the fire died the moment it touched him, the flames winking out as though they had never been. The Aethar he had used to create them simply vanished, sucked into the void that was Thilmarius. How is he doing that? Do you like fire, Barat? You use it like a child. Let me show you how it should be done. Magic flowed from the Prathian's fingers, weaving itself into a flame that seemed alive. It spiraled outward in ropes that grew and writhed around him, burning with intense heat, and then it converged on Tyrion. His shield kept it at bay, but it was mere inches from his skin, and the heat radiated through, baking him within his protections. Tyrion didn't have long. Frantic, he spun, using his arm blades in an attempt to destroy the spell weave, but the fire simply let them pass, reforming behind them as they passed. Reverting to old tactics, Tyrion ripped the earth from beneath Thilmarius' feet, or tried to, but the moment the Aethar he sent into the soil touched the Law Warden's feet, it vanished. A blast of wind failed as well, and his skin was beginning to blister inside his shield. 
Desperate, and knowing he was only seconds from death, Tyrion lifted his arm and channeled a blast of force through the tattoos on his arm. This time he was rewarded, for the magic didn't die when it reached the Law Warden. It sent his opponent hurtling backward to smash into the stone wall of the house. Tyrion heard bone snap when the Shihar impacted the wall. The flames around him vanished, and he knew he had found victory. Thelmeria slumped to the ground, and then, impossibly, he stood up again. Tyrion watched in astonishment as the Law Warden's upper arm straightened, the bones realigning. A large depression in the side of his skull swelled outward and then took its normal shape again. And still the Shi'ar was a black blot of nothingness to his mage sight. What have you done to yourself? he asked. Thilmarius laughed, wondering why I won't die. You already killed me, Barat, but I decided that I wouldn't let that stop me from returning the favor. Tyrion couldn't help but think of Bridget's chain. It would have been an ideal weapon. He wondered how his foe would fare if it were cut into a dozen small pieces. The chain was in his bedroom, a memento he had brought back with him to remember Bridget. But he couldn't use it. No one could. It would respond only to her Aethar. But he knew his arm blade still worked. Even if stabbing wasn't the best attack, slashing would work much better. And for some reason power channeled through the runes on his arms worked when raw Aethar failed. He started to level another channel blast at the Shi'ha but Thilmarius vanished, falling back on the talent of the Prathians again. Tyrion created an Aethar-laced mist to hide him from Thilmarius, but it died as soon as it contacted the skin of his already dead opponent. He couldn't tell where the contact had been. Changing tactics, he sent a lacework of energy through the soil beneath his feet. He had used the technique in the past to discover where hidden enemies were standing. It would likely fail this time, but he would at least know where Thilmarius was when it contacted him. The spell died almost immediately. Thilmarius was standing immediately beside him. Before he could react, a spell weave with the force of an avalanche struck. It was almost the same thing he had just done seconds before, except Tyrion's body couldn't recover as Thilmarius's head. He felt something crack deep in his chest when he struck the wall, and then the world went black. Opening his eyes, he knew, somewhere in his fuzz-laden brain, that he must have lost consciousness. His shield was gone, and Thilmarius was kneeling over him. He struggled to move as the Law Warden's hand reached for his throat, but his body was sluggish and reluctant to obey. As their skin came into contact, he felt a cold wind blow through his soul. The world dimmed, and it felt as though he had ice in his veins. What little energy he had left quickly faded. Helpless, he stared into the eyes of the man he had hated and feared for so long. He was going to die. After you're gone, I'll release Lorelliantha and remake this world, said Thilmarius. I want you to know that. Whatever you think you accomplished, with all this meaningless destruction, it was for naught. You suffered, your family suffered, your children died, for nothing but your stupid animalistic pride. No one will mourn your passing, betrayer. Tyrion gasped, his chest growing too weak to even draw breath. You lost before we even started, Tyrion, the Shi'ar informed him. I can't die. Watch me, father, Brigitte had told him. Watch me bleed, watch me burn. In his mind's eye, Tyrion saw her bones falling into dust once more as her energy faded away. And then his eye noticed the flames on the ground behind Thilmarius. The dry grass there had caught fire when the Shi'ar's burning spell weave had been around him. I can't die, thought Tyrion. But that body can burn, and if there's nothing left. The cold emptiness almost made it easier for him, as he let his mind slip away, expanding and encompassing not the earth or wind, but the tiny flame burning a few feet away. Tyrion became the flame, and the fire became his rage. A pillar of fire blossomed, roaring skyward, and Thilmarius released his neck, turning around to see what had happened. Tyrion fell on him. And this time the fire didn't die, for this fire was not born of magic, of deliberately molded Aethar. This was a natural flame, imbued with the will and murderous rage of Tyrion Elenial. It caught the unnatural body of the Law Warden within it, and then it began to burn ever brighter, becoming a scathing white column of incandescent fury. Thilmarius screamed, a hideous cry of impotent despair as his body was reduced to ash. Then he was gone. Tyrion almost thought he could still see him, like a spirit left behind once his body was gone. But then even that faded away. 
With nothing left to burn and no will to do more, the fire began to die, and Tyrion collapsed inward, until at last he was just a man, cold and broken on the ground beside his home. He could hardly move. Something had broken, probably his collarbone, but he still felt a strange sense of contentment. He had been disappointed by his failure to reach Thilmerius before. As brutal as the fight had been, it gave him a sense of closure. I won, asshole, he whispered. Tyrion managed painfully to drag himself into the house, otherwise he would have frozen to death. He passed out after that, and whether it was one day or three before he woke again, he was never able to figure out. It didn't matter. He lived. When he did come round, he spent a long time sorting out his injuries, fixing his broken collarbone and mending several other less serious fractures. The bruises he could do little about, and the blisters from his burns were hard to deal with as well. Something simply took time. Eventually, he was able to walk, and after that he took care of his other needs. There was still food in the kitchen, and while his cooking was awful compared to Kate's, he wouldn't starve. After a week had passed, he realized his food wouldn't last forever. He hadn't planned well for this part. The townsfolk, frozen in stasis, didn't need to eat, but he did, and so would they when they were eventually brought back. The winter had turned bitterly cold, and ice was everywhere. The livestock in Colne were probably still alive, but when the winter failed to abate after a few months, most of the animals would die. Tyrion had nothing but time, though. After a second week of recovering, he went back to his parents' home. It was a relief to find them gone. He had never checked to make sure that they had relocated with the other villagers, and he'd been afraid he might find their bodies there. The sheep were all right so he herded them slowly back to Albemarle. Over the following months, he crafted new stasis boxes to keep them in, one by one, along with the horses and other animals he found in Cole. The people would need them when they returned. They had worried about food, but the entire world had become a freezer. The food left behind in the abandoned homes of Cole was hard frozen when he recovered it for his larder. Some of it he stored, some of it he ate. He spent the rest of the year slowly gathering everything of value, food, tools, and animals. What he didn't use for himself, he put into stasis. Alone, he had nothing but time. The year turned, but winter never faded. He had considered waking Lyra to keep him company. The threat of the Crytek he had created was long past, but that was impossible. He decided not to bother waking any of his children either, since there was nothing for them. The world was dark cold and bleak. Tyrion waited and watched, eating food that had lost all flavor from being frozen too long. The entire world seemed a perfect reflection of his soul. Epilogue He was shocked when Abby walked into the house. He had been alone for so long he had begun to talk to himself, and he frequently thought that he heard his children's voices, but he knew they were just his imagination. Tyrion stared at her carefully, trying to determine whether she was real or just a dream. He had lost track of time. Had it been a year? That was when she was supposed to awaken. She stared back at him, a look of pity on her face. You look terrible, father. He reached up, scratching his face through the long beard he had grown. Not been worse, he replied. He jumped when a second figure stepped through the door, a man he didn't recognize. Who's that? he asked suspiciously. Relax, she said, holding out her hand placatingly. This is Davor, one of the Morden we preserved. I woke him to help me get here sooner. It would have taken a week on foot. Oh. They spotted the tattoos around the man's throat. It was one of the slave mages. Are you hungry? he asked. That was the only conversation he could think of. Abby shook her head. No, I ate not long before we went into stasis. It feels like I just left the kitchen. What do you have in there? Some meat, he told her. Beef, I think. It's hard to remember. And there are turnips and carrots, too. She walked into the kitchen to inspect his provisions, and what she saw appalled her. When she returned, she glared at him. Have you been cooking any of it? The vegetables were frozen and appeared to be partially gnawed. 
The beef was raw, and it looked as though he had simply been tearing pieces from it when he got hungry. None of the dishes looked to have been used in recent history. He had been alone so long that he felt like a child as he looked into her angry face. No, he whispered, his voice cracking. And then he began to cry. His reaction startled her, and her native compassion immediately rose to the fore. Shh, it's all right. What's wrong? What happened? He flinched when she put her hands on his shoulders, and it took her several awkward minutes to finally get him to relax so she could hug him. He cried brokenly for a while, and then he began to talk. He told her of Lurilianthus' predicament and Brigid's end. He told her about Thilmarius, and then he talked of the winter. Through it all he ached, from his heart outward, because he knew that in a few days she would be gone again, back to stasis, while he remained to watch and wait. Abby listened without commenting much, and when he had finally run out of words, she rubbed her hands on her skirt and stood up. Let me see what I can do about that kitchen. You need a hot meal. She worked in there for several hours, lighting a fire in the long dead hearth and cleaning several pots. After she had located some vegetables in a stasis box that looked like they wouldn't turn to mush once they were thawed, she began to cook. She discarded the frozen lump of beef and recovered a fresh-looking piece of mutton from another stasis box. When she finished, the pot was bubbling, and a heavenly aroma filled the house. Tyrion stood in the doorway, his eyes red and his face pale. What's that? Mutton stew, one of your favourites, she replied. Kate taught me to make it, and while it's probably not as good as hers, I think you'll find it an improvement over what you've been having. They ate, and Tyrion couldn't have said if it was better or worse than Kate's. It had been so long that it tasted like heaven to him, and he ate so much that when he finally stopped his stomach began to churn. Rushing outside, he vomited onto the frozen ground. Abby stroked his back while he heaved. You ate too much too fast. Your body couldn't handle it. He looked up at her. I want some more. So he ate again, this time more modestly, and Abby began to give him her news. Emma and Ryan didn't make it back, she said bluntly. Devil and I checked the site she was supposed to go to. It appears they never got to the seventh one. I think they died at the sixth, the one near the Galen Grove. Did you see any sign of the she he asked. Did any of the elders survive? He had never found one living during his wandering, but he wanted to be sure. Nothing but the dead, she answered. Even the she the children, their bodies are still out there, frozen. He had seen as much in the areas of the Elenial and Prathian groves. Would you like to see where she died? asked Abby. Davor and I could take you. There was an odd tone in her voice, but Tyrion's mind was too disorganized to take note of it. The warmth of the food in his belly the warmth of her presence, the presence of another human being, had all made him dizzy. He couldn't bear the thought of her leaving again. Anything to keep her with him a little longer. The loneliness was unbearable. He doubted he could survive it again. Sure. We'll go in the morning, she decided. Tonight you need a proper rest. She made him sleep in Layla's room after she had cleaned it. He had been sleeping in his own bedroom wrapped in a blanket of magical warmth while Kate and Garland's frozen corpses lay nearby, but Abby wouldn't allow that. The air felt warmer there, despite the altitude. Perhaps it was because they were closer to the sun, or perhaps it was his imagination. The region where the Galen Grove had been was drastically different. Emma's handiwork had caused the land to sink, except for the mountain that had risen where they stood. The ocean had rushed in, filling the area around it to create a new sea. The site of Emma's fall was now a large rocky island with long slopes that stretched down to the water. It seemed fitting. Whatever had happened to her and Ryan's bodies, they never found them. They had probably been buried or incinerated. Massive flows of hardened lava covered much of the island landscape, and some of it was still hot. That might explain the warmer temperature here, thought Tyrion. Abby and Tyrion stood in a flat depression, high up on one side of the new mountain. They were alone, having left Davor to wait near the shoreline. Reaching out, she took his hand. You did it, father, she told him. You and Emma. Yeah, he replied, his voice toneless and empty. With your help, too.
I'm not proud of that, she answered. I never really wanted this. All the death. It was too much. Too late to lament that now. What will you do now? she asked. In a few years, or a decade, when this winter finally ends, we can wake everyone up, he said flatly. And then? Then we raise the children, train them to fight, rebuild the world, he finished. She raised an eyebrow. Train them to fight, like you did with us. Why, there are no enemies left. How little she knew. The Shiha were gone, but they hadn't come from nowhere. Reality was much larger than the world that humanity knew. Someday others might come, crossing the void between dimensions as the Shiha had. He intended to make certain that humankind was strong and ready for when that day came. There is always a need for fighting, he told her, his voice gaining some of its former steel. We will never be weak again. I won't allow it. His hand tightened until she pulled hers away to prevent him from crushing it. Our race once had power almost too great to believe, and the Shiha crushed them. We were naive. Now we have the power that the Shiha brought with them, and I have some of the knowledge our ancestors possessed. I will rebuild the world. We can resurrect our technology and perfect the power we have taken from the Shiha, build ourselves into a force too great for any enemy to ever challenge again, he finished with conviction. Abby looked up at him, her face sad. A solitary tear tracked its way down one cheek. You can't let it go, can you? Let what go? he asked, staring at her in confusion. Never mind, she said, wrapping her arms around him and burying her face against his chest. Too late, he noticed the blade in her hand. He had trusted her completely, and solitude had made his instincts dull. By the time his mage sight took note of it, it had already started sliding into his back, finding its way neatly between two vertebrae and severing his spinal cord. It went in high, between his shoulder blades, causing his arms and legs to jerk and then go limp instantly. Falling, he never felt the ground when he landed. Abby knelt over him, her face wet with tears, the bloody knife still in her hand. Why? he mouthed, unable to exhale. His body could feel nothing except the burning ember of fiery pain between his shoulders. Pressing outward, he tried to use his aether to push her away, but Abby fought back, measuring her power against his. In the end, it wasn't enough. The pain was too great, and his body was weak from a year of solitude and bad food. She smothered his power with her own, pinning him down, trapping him within the only part of him that worked, his mind. I'm sorry, father, she whispered, looking down on him, her face only inches away. None of us want the world you dream of. We want a new beginning, a place where people can be happy. We can't do that by bringing the old hatreds with us. We can't bring you with us. Lyra, he gasped. She nodded. We'll try to free her. Someday we'll figure out a way. Promise. Abby kissed his forehead, still crying. I promise. Then she stood. Looking down, she saw the light in his eyes had gone out, and the aether that defined his existence had almost faded. Dropping the knife, she walked away, toward a sea that beat mercilessly against rocky shores. She was too far away to notice the transformation. There was no flash of aether when it happened, and she was keeping her mage sight focused firmly on the world in front of her, rather than the patricide that lay behind. And was all she could do to keep walking. A sapling grew where Tyrion's body had fallen, and in time it would become a mighty tree. She killed him, exclaimed Moira. Her own father, that's awful. I nodded, and it was probably for the best. That's the worst story I ever heard, she complained, disgust on her face. The problem is the word father, I told her. When you think of it, you think of me, Mordecai, the man who raised you, who loved you. That's not what Tyrion was to her. He was a monster, declared Moira. Then she looked at Lynn Arala, realizing she was speaking of her friend's actual parent. Sorry, Lynn, I shouldn't have said that. Lynn Arala shrugged, unaffected as usual. I never knew him as a man. That's why they sent me here, to understand what being human is. Matthew spoke then. What I don't get is how did Mum get the other part of it? 
the other part of what? asked Moira. Well, the Loshti that was passed down from Layla to one of her children and so on until now, with Dad and me. But Mum has the other thing, the Elenial gift, right? And looked to Mordecai, hoping for an answer. I nodded. That's my theory. She's no wizard, but she must have inherited something to cause her to have her visions. But how? They killed Lyra's baby, Garling, said Matthew. I gave my son a sympathetic look. I'm not sure. I suspect they did the same thing Tyrion did, creating a human child and then hiding it away, protected by a stasis weaving. But that information isn't within the scope of my knowledge or yours. The Elanials were playing the long game. And now it has come full circle, said Linarala, with me. It was an obvious conclusion, since she was the first true Shiha child to be born in two thousand years, the beginning of the rebirth of the Elanial Shiha. But I wasn't so sure. Looking at Matthew, I had a different suspicion, but I didn't voice it. Penny stuck her head in through the doorway. Enough dark stories, come eat. What is it? asked Matthew with sudden interest. If it's mutton stew, I'm not eating it, stated Moira. I don't think I could ever eat that again, not after what we just heard. I laughed and hugged her, grateful that my relationship with my children was as close as it was. Reaching out, I tried to snag Matthew with my other arm, but he ducked away. Let's not get too touchy, old man, he said with a grin. We went and found our dinner, and thankfully, it was not mutton stew. You have been listening to The Betrayer's Bane, book three of The Embers of Elenial, produced by Greg Lawrence, associate producer Emily Durr, text copyright 2016 by Michael G. Manning, production copyright 2017 by Podium Publishing, all rights reserved. If you enjoyed this audiobook, let us know. Take a quick moment to rate and review it on Audible so we know we're bringing you audiobooks you'll love. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.